Okay, so welcome to Sunday Shir. Uh, the updated title, Midrashic Embellishment. Why did Chazal villainize the bad guys and vindicate the good guys beyond what is stated in the Psukim? And what are the educational implications for us? Okay, um, and uh, and like the last uh, Sunday, or not the last Sunday Shir, like many of these, I hope this is more of a discussion than a Shir. Um, and uh, uh, I think there's gonna be a lot of stuff to discuss. So let's get started. Okay, so um, introduction with objectives, warnings, disclaimers, and acknowledgements. So there are five objectives of today's year. Okay, first objective is to disturb you. Okay, and by disturbing you, I mean this in two ways. Okay, one is exposing, uh, I, I have a feeling that certain people are gonna be exposed to, to approaches or ideas that might not sit well with them. Okay, particularly with um, people who were raised on Rashi's approach to Chumash uh, and uh, will engage in the pearl clutching of the pearls being Rashi's parish of saying, but Rashi says, okay, here's the thing. Rashi's great. Okay. We love Rashi, right? But saying, but Rashi says is not an objection. So, so, and, and today, one of the things that might be disturbing is that we will see approaches to Chumash other than Rashi and we'll, uh, you know, we'll contrast it with, uh, with some of the uh, more shot based on the here. Okay. Um, second way in which I hope to disturb you is I kind of hope to raise more questions than I'm going to answer. Okay, like I have certain points and certain ideas, but I hope that we end, we walk away from this thinking about lots of questions and not knowing the answers because these are practical questions about like how to educate and how, you know, what direction your society is going in. Okay, so in terms of the actual objectives, um, first I want to establish that Hazal villainized the bad guys and vindicated the good guys beyond what stated took him, but I want to establish that they did this as a as a method or a derech or an approach or a style of drush, okay? Not just in this case and that case, but this is actually a pattern. After that, I'm going to present a particular Chacham's uh, understanding of this approach, and I'll explain who it is later on. Then I'm going to share my own understanding of why Chazal did this. And then at the end, we are going to discuss the benefits and limitations of this approach and its implications for Jewish society. Okay, so first of all, I also want to say this is a, um, you could view this as a sequel to the Sunday share I gave last year called Midrashic Betrayal, because this year is built on the premises that I established in that year. And for that reason, I'm not going to go over and establish all of my premises again. I brought ample sources from all the Gonim and Rishonim to, you know, to, to solidify the foundation on which today's year is going to be built. Also, this is a sequel in the sense that um, that, that year started off with my uh, what I viewed as the, the biggest problem with how Midrashim are presented in, in Jewish education. This is going to present, I think, hopefully another element of the problem, but also moving towards a solution. So this is, this is uh, conceptually building off of, uh, of, uh, of you know, the, the, the trajectory of the last uh, year also. Okay. Um, quick review of the premises that I'm working with. So these were the six premises, the six guidelines. Sorry, before we get to that. Basic definitions of pshat and drash. Okay, so the, the definition I gave in the last year was pshat is the meaning of the words as intended by the author. Author with a lowercase a if you're talking about something in nach, author with an uppercase a if you're talking about chumash. Uh, and then uh, I had a long discussion with Yaakov Trachman afterwards in which we established that there is a more common notion of pshat, which is the most straightforward reading of the text. I also will be using that definition in this year. Um, I, I don't like that definition as much because it's subject to a lot more uh, um, debate about how straightforward is straightforward, but uh, that is the assumption here. Drush, in contrast, is utilizing the words of the psukim as a platform for an extrinsic idea, an idea from outside of the psukim. And we went over four categories of drush last time, uh, two subcategories, which is midrash agada, our non-legalistic teachings, some of which are pshat oriented, which they're designed to provide insight into the actual meaning of the psukim, and others are on the psukim, but they have nothing to do with the meaning of the pasuk as intended by the author. Okay, so like the example, Ramam's of uh, Yaseh, uh, Ram uses the example of Yaseh Tielcha al Azaynecha, that uh, the pshat of the pasuk is you should have a shovel with your weaponry. The, the drush is you should put your fingers in your ears when you hear Lashon Hara. That has nothing to do with the actual pshat of the pasuk. Okay, then yes. The first, the very first, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that assuming that when the author would write a that there was an expectation that it would be not meaning something else, it would be next? Uh, so the two were definitely written in a way that lend themselves to drush, but which of those intentions were incorporated 
in the original intent and which ones were not, I'm not going to get into right now. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we're going to comment on it, but uh, we're, I don't want to get into that right now. Okay, uh, then there's halakhic drushos, which this year is not going to deal with. Okay, so everything this year is just about Agada talk. Okay, uh, then we had the six guidelines for learning uh, Midrash Agada that we established in the last year. First one and the most important one is that Midrashim are the theories of Chazal. They are not, they were not given at Sinai. They were, are not the word of Hashem and we are not obligated to accept them. Okay, and this is what, you know, there are some, Akronim, uh, and maybe, I, I don't know any Rishonim, but there are some Akronim who disagree with this, but the overwhelming majority of Rishonim and Gaonim uh, and Akronim uh, hold that the, the, the Chazal authored these ideas. Okay, two, we don't rely on Midrash for proof or disproof because these are just Chazal's theories. They aren't unanimous and they're cryptic, so you can't just like quote a Midrash to disprove or prove something. Three, uh, we only take from Midrash what makes sense. Uh, there's no obligation or virtue in just saying, I believe this Midrash, if you don't understand it or if it doesn't make sense to you. Four, Midrash were written to teach us ideas, not to provide us with facts, history, or entertainment. Five, uh, Midrash are not to be taken, taken at face value. I think this is pretty clear in our yeshiva that you have to interpret them and analyze them and understand them. Uh, and six is if it doesn't make sense to us, then we shouldn't reject it or, or mock it. We should just say, I don't know what it means, and then come back to it later. Like Ram says, you should, you know, daven that Hashem will enlighten your eyes. And I wanted to highlight number six. Nothing in today's year should be construed as a mockery of drush, okay? Even though there are going to be some statements from, from various mafarshim that seem to be dismissive of, of, of drush, um, you know, even the, uh, you, know, e you know, you have many mafarshim who would just say, oh, that's just a drush. That shouldn't be taken as saying that the drushos have little value. It's just saying that it's drush as opposed to pshat, okay? We're not belittling uh, drushos, okay? Um, I'm going to depict the... Uh, the two approaches as a battle between Rashi and Avraham ben Rama, because these are the two main Mepharshim that we're going to start off with. Um, Rashi also, as we know, most of Rashi's comments come from Chazal. Um, and Avraham ben Rama, I'm using as kind of like the stand-in for the Pshat-based Mepharshim. I include in the team Pshat, you know, Saadi Gon, Shmuel ben Chofni, Targum Onkelos, Ibn Ezra, Mari Kra, Rashbam, Rabag, Radak, Beforshar, Abravnel, Sforno, and Shadal. Those are my main Pshat guys. And then the, uh, the Drush, Drushos approach, is the Targum Yushami, Chaskuni, Ramban, Rabbeinu Bakhya, a lot of the Bali Tosvos, Orachim, Kliyakar, and some of these sit in the middle, like the Radak, and the use Pshat, and they use Drash, okay? But I, 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 these are two distinct approaches to, uh, to Chamesh that we're going to talk about, okay? Um, also, just in terms of, if you were wondering, isn't Rashi Pshat? So I found this uh, gem of a statement from Ibn Ezra, which I had never seen until uh, Shabbos, in a book he wrote called Safar Brura. So he says, uh, Rashi wrote a commentary on Torah and Avim Exuvim in the manner of Drash, and he thought it was in the manner of Pshat, but his books don't contain even 1,000th Pshat. Uh, yet the sages in our generation praise themselves in their knowledge of these books. And one of the reasons why I want to, you know, depict this approach as being Rashi is I think that there is like a Rashi hegemony in Jewish education where, where people are raised to view Rashi as more significant or more important or carry more weight than other Mepharshim. So I'm siding with the Ibn Ezra here. I know it's a debate as to how much of Rashi's commentary is Pshat and how much is not. I'm siding with the, 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 the side that says it's not Pshat. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, uh, a commercial um, and also a, a debt of, of gratitude here. Uh, this is the new edition of Avram ben Ramam. Okay, there's Avram ben Ramam. He wrote a commentary on Breshis and Shmos, and then he also wrote a, uh, a treatise on Agarita. Uh, this is the new edition produced by a rabbi, Moshe Maimon, in, I think, Lakewood or Muncie. Um, excellent, excellent edition. And really, all the sources that I found were from his extensive footnotes, which explain Avram ben Ramam and, uh, and you know, cite you every... All conceivable uh, Rishonim and Gonim and Akronim uh, to, to get these, and you should buy them on eBay for twenty to thirty dollars. Yeah. Just acting, that was, um, yeah. So the concept of chop is consistent through all the time? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They may have. They may have subtleties. For example, R Rush Bomb held. Rush Bomb did not rely on Midrashim in his commentary, by and large, but Rush Bomb held that Rashi was giving chat. Okay, whereas Ibn Ezra holds that Rashi was not giving shot. So it seems like they had two different definitions of what shot was. And he said that Rashi Yeah. Yes. I don't know what he thought Rashi's idea of shot was. I don't know if he was it. My guess is that he would assume that Rashi. I mean, uh, I would like to think that Ibn Ezra assumed that Rashi had a different definition of shot, not that just he was really bad at it, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So without further ado, we're going to start off with three examples of this phenomenon, okay? And I'm going to, again, contrast Rashi in the Midrash with Avram ben Rambam, okay? And we're going to use these examples 
keeping them in mind to establish that this phenomenon is, is real. Okay, first example is Aesop. Okay, so let's see how, how your uh, childhood Jewish education went. So it says in Brashis 25, 29, Yaakov simmered a stew and Aesop came in from the field and he was weary. So what does Rashi say? He came in from the field. What does that imply? Murdering. Murdering. Yeah. Exactly, right? So Rashi says he was weary because when you murder people, you get weary, okay? So the source of this Rashi, Rashi only quotes the murdering aspect, uh, but there are different midrashim that talk about what Aesop was doing in the field. So the, the cleanest, um, most concise midrash version of this is um, uh, in just a collection of midrashim here. Aesop came in from the field. He committed five transgressions that day. He stole, okay, as it says in Ovadia, it says... Um, he uses the word im ganavim ba'ula. He uses the word ba. And by, by Esau, it says uh, uh, vayavo. So from the fact that he uses the word he came, and came is associated with thievery, so then you see that Esau clearly stole. Okay. Two, he violated a nara hamurasa, a betrothed maiden. Okay. Similarly, Gzir Shava says if he, if he will find her in the field, that's referring to a case of, uh, of rape, and it is written about Esau, he came in from the field. So what do you do in the field if you're Esau? You rape people. Okay. Uh, three, he committed murder. Uh, again, another Limud here. With the, that's one that Rashi quotes. He's weary. Four, he denied God's existence. He was covert by Iker. And five is he disparaged the birthright. Okay, that one's in the Pshat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you don't need a Xerah Shama for that. Uh, there's another Midrash which states these things and then also says that as a result of this, God shortened Abraham's lifespan. Right. This is, I think, another one people quote. Hakadosh Baruch Hu said, I, "Thus have I promised Abraham, and you will come to your forefathers in peace." This refers to good old age. And if he sees his grandson worshiping idols, committing primitive sexual relations and murdering, it would be better for him to depart in peace, right? So, so better to you know, take Avram from the world uh, than to let him see uh, his grandson like this. Okay, uh, let's look at Avram and Ram. Avram and Ram gives shot. He was weary from the length of the journey and the hard work of the hunt. And it is possible that he had gone a long time without food as frequently happens to travelers, even the wealthy among them. Okay, that's plain shot. He was, he was a hunter, he was traveling, okay? Then Avram and Ram comments on the Midrash. He says, regarding the notion that he committed murder, this is similar to the statement that he violated a betrothed maiden. Namely, they are statements that are poetic embellishments and literary tropes. That's how I'm translating Yofi shall shir umulitsa, which we'll see Avram and Ram's definition in just a second. So he says, they are poetic embellishments and literary tropes for those who utter them, and they are delightful or preferable to those who deal in such Midrashim, but they are neither compelling nor plausible to those who care about verifiable truths. In other words, if you're interested in actually figuring out what happened, that's not what these midrashim are about. These midrashim are about embellishments. Okay, now what does he mean by embellishments? So in his mamar on the drashos, he, he says there are five categories of drash. The fourth category is drashos that they said, that Chazal said in the explanation of Psukim by way of poetic embellishment, not because the author held that this drasha was the intended meaning of the pasa. Okay, so that's the definition of pshat we were going with. These drashos are not pshat, they're not what the author intended. Concerning statements like these, Chazal said the Pasuk is one thing and the Midrash is another. Okay, that was the whole Midrash of betrayal here, because you don't mix those two categories. Then he says, do not think that any statement that Chazal say in explaining the Pesukim is a tradition they had. Okay, as is thought by the masses who have not attained accurate knowledge and say that just as the foundations of the Halakha and the teachings of the oral Torah are a tradition, so too are these words of Chazal in non-Halakhic matters. Again, we talked about this extensively in Midrash of Betrayal. Rav Hirsch said that the worst thing a teacher can do is to teach his students that Midrashim are from, uh, Midrashic, uh, uh, Agadic Midrashim are from Sinai, right? Uh, these are not traditions, these were authored by Chazal. And then Avraham Ramam says, he says, for the matter is not so. Rather know that the explanations of the Pesukim, which are not relevant for halacha and laws, some of them were stated by way of inference and decided interpretations. In other words, some of them, some of the Midrashim are actually all trying to interpret the Pesukim and to infer real things. Whereas others were said by way of romantic elaboration and embellishment in which they attached to the scriptural statement, whatever they were able to attach by way of valid understanding in the manner of poetic elaboration. Now that is a mouthful. And that's kind of what we are going to try to understand in this entire shears. What were they doing when they gave these drashos? And by romantic with a capital R, uh, we're going to talk about what that means later on. I'm, I'm using that word intentionally here. Okay. So the point I want to pull out of this Avram and Ram on the drashos is that that these drushos were not intended to uh, explain what the Pshat of the Pasuk was by Chazal. Okay, but he goes further, okay, and this is where there's gonna be some pearl clutching, okay. Avram ben Arambam holds that Esav was perfected. 
He's a perfected person. Okay, where does he write this? He writes this in the Maspik of Deshan. He says, um, so he's he, he's talking about how brachos work and the why Yitzchak had to have um, delicacies. Okay, before he blessed um, uh, Esav. So he says, even Esav understood the secret of Yitzchak's phrase, "My soul will bless you," and he guarded it in his heart. And when he came before Yitzchak, he said, so that your soul will bless me. Although he did not reach Yaakov's level of perfection, he also had a measure of perfection, although it was less than that of Yaakov. You should be convinced of this by the mere fact that Yitzchak erred about Esau and considered him to be completely perfected, such that he gave him precedence over Yaakov. So he does not take the approach that Esau was tricking his father and that Esau was really a Russia. He holds that they were both perfected. Yaakov was just more so. And Yitzchak, you know, thought that uh, Esau was perfected enough to give him the bracha. Additionally, the perfection of Esau is indicated by his diligence and his fastidiousness over the blessing and his pain over the relinquishment of his birthright. Again, nothing here about, you know, Esau being like, um, uh, like impetuous and like, like rejecting the avoda, like, no, plain shot of the psukim is that he was really upset because he wanted to partake in the legacy of the avos. Okay. Um, yes. I have a question on kind of what Rashi said earlier. Did he learn like two things, or maybe it's the measures, but uh, were there two things learned out from the same like word of that he was tired? And are those in disagreement? Or are those uh, in conjunction when he was listing when he was listing the five things, um, I think there are there's the, the way that midrashim work is there is room for darshaning the same word to have many midrashic interpretations. That's in fact where uh, the phrase shivim pine the Torah. If you do like a, a search on Bar Ilan, you know you'll find that that's where they apply it. Of like when you're in the world of Agadita, you can have many many different interpretations of the same phrase. So they might be in contradiction. They might just be different ways of taking it. Yeah, Yaakov. Uh, right. Um, we'd have to read his commentary on that. Yeah, I'll remember on him. That's maybe for uh, another year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Example number two. We're just going through this to establish the, the patterns here. Okay. Maisa Rubin. Now, I gave a whole shear on this uh, last year as well. So if you want to listen to uh, the full treatment of this, then you can find that shear. The Pasuk says in... Um, the brachos that Yaakov gives to his children at the end. Uh, he says, Reuven, you are my firstborn, my strength and my initial vigor, foremost in rank and foremost in power. Unstable like water, you cannot be foremost because you mounted your father's bed. Okay. Ki alisa mishkavea avicha. Az hilata yitzui Allah. Now there's a lot of controversy about how to translate that. Claim uh, shot, then he who ascended my couch was desecrated. Okay. And that's referring to Reuven. So, um, Earlier, where it actually says the incident, it says in the Pasuk, right? So uh, Reuven went out and went and lay with Bilha, his father's concubine, and Israel heard. Then you've got the weird dot, dot, dot ellipses, and then the Pasuk continues in a new paragraph, the sons of Yaakov were 12. Now, what does Chazal say about this? I feel like this is also something people know. He didn't literally sleep with her. He didn't literally sleep with her, right? And in fact, what, what happens if you say that he slept with her? Then you're you're wrong, right? So, oh, sorry. Divrei Yamim also says that. Uh, in Divrei Yamim, it says, Uchalolo yituyavit. Okay, fine. But the Gemara in Shabbos, Daf Nun Hayam and Beis says, Rufmul Bar Nachmeni said in the name of Rabbi Yonasan, anyone who says that Reuben sinned, okay, in the incident of Bilha, is only making a mistake. That's, Koha Omer Reuben Chata Eno Ela Toa. Okay, as it is stated, and the sons of Yaakov were 12. This teaches that all of them were equal in righteousness. Um, and the Gemara goes on, explains what actually happened. How then do I establish, and he lay with Bilhah, the concubine of his father. This teaches that Reuven rearranged his father's bed, and the verse ascribes to him the liability as if he had actually lain with Bilhah. Okay, and there are, are you know, explanations for why he did that. Rashi on the Pasuk says he lay with Bilhah because he rearranged Yaakov's bed. The verse ascribes to him liability as if he lay with her. Okay, now let's go to Avram ben Rambam. So that's Rashi, that's Chazal, that's the Midrash. Okay, Avram ben Rambam. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, Rashi explains why he did that because he was uh, he felt it was an insult to his mother that Yaakov didn't move back into her tent. Okay. Uh, okay, fine. And then Rashi says explicitly. Sorry, I forgot. I, I quoted this extensively. He says. Um, uh, Rashi says, our rabbis expounded, this is to teach us that all of them were equal and all of them were righteous and that Reuben did not sin, right? So not, not an actual sin. Okay, so now, Avram ben Raman quotes Sadigon, who follows the the, uh, the Midrashic approach that he didn't actually uh, sleep with Bilhah, and then he says, this explanation is founded in the Drush, whoever says that Reuben's sin is only making a mistake, 
Okay, so that rule, he's saying it's not a hard and fast rule. That's a drush, all right? Ibn Ezra said, the meaning of the Pasuk is that from the time that you desecrated, my couch went up. In other words, my couch was cut off. This alludes to the fact that Yaakov refrained from having relations with Bilha after that incident. This explanation in contrast to the drush is based on the shot of the Pasuk. Now, it's kind of confusing to tell what he actually holds went on here, but he is saying that the shot is that um, is that Ruvain sinned. And in fact, many Mepharshim take this approach. And I just want to do a quick survey. Again, there's a whole sheet on this. Um, Radak just says straight out, Vishahavima, he slept with her. Okay. Um, and he gives a reason. He, he thought that she wouldn't be prohibited to him. Okay, fine. Ramban, even though the Ramban also goes with the Midrash, he acknowledges that according to the Pshat, he says it's possible that Reuven confounded Bilha's bed by sleeping with her out of fear that Yaakov would bear more children, for Reuven was the firstborn and expected to receive a double portion. And if Yaakov had more children, he would lose more than all the brothers. So he holds that Reuven was actually trying to stop his father from having more kids. Okay. Um, Rabag is the most extreme of the opinions. Uh, he says, you see how despicable Reuven's sexual crime was, which was caused by his lack of deliberation in his actions and the fact that he acted in haste without consideration. And that's what Yaakov was condemning when he says he's Papa's Kamayim. <laughs> Rabag then says, you know, throughout <laughs> Rabag's commentary, he says Reuben was not a Chacham. He says that, um, that uh, only a person um, so disgusting as to engage in such actions is someone with a deficient mind. Okay, like he really takes <laughs> does not take the premise that Reuven was a, was a tzaddik. He says that the fact that Reuven threatened to kill his own sons shows that he is uh, the tachlis hapsayus, he's utmost idiocy. Okay, so again, you see that that despite the fact that Chazal said that anyone who says Reuven didn't sin, sorry, anyone who says Reuven sinned is only making a mistake, there are many Mepharshim who say that he slept with Bilha, right? So how do we, what do we do with that? Okay, and even the Rambam holds that lahalacha, when you take the Sota out and you're trying to get her to confess, he says, uh, uh, we tell her, my daughter, many preceded you and were swept away and many great and exceptional individuals were overpowered by their inclination and stumbled. We tell her the incident of Yehuda and Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and the incident with Reuven and the concubine of his father according to its pshat, okay? And the incident of Amnon and his sister in order to make it easier for her to confess, okay? So in other words, you, you, you teach, you tell her that Reuven slept with Bilha, okay? And that's in Halakha, right? So again, uh, what, uh, you know, what did Chazal exactly mean when they said that you, you can't say that that uh, Reuven said? <coughs> okay, example number three, shortest one, uh, Dasan and Aviram. Okay, so in B'Shalah, it says, Vayomru el Moshe, they said to Moshe, are there not enough graves in Egypt that you took us to die in the wilderness? What is this that you have done to us to take us out of Egypt? Okay, so I, I couldn't find a Rashi that says this, but there are Midrashim that allude to the fact that this was Dasan and Aviram. The clearest one is this um, uh, Midrash Gadol which is, a, I think, a Taimani collection of Midrashim that was published by Kafa, who says, you find that Dasan and Aviram were prepared for punishment from the beginning until the end. They were the ones about whom it was said in Egypt, and behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. I think that people know, right? That the puzzle doesn't say it's Dasan and Aviram, but like, you know, you're taught from an early age that that was Dasan and Aviram. Uh, they are the ones about whom it was said they approached Moshe and Aaron, and they were the ones about whom it was said at the sea, they said to Moshe, are there not enough graves in Egypt? Okay, so this is where... And I have to thank Chaim Zifkin for this because the whole shear came from Chaim Zifkin asking me, what's the deal with Dasan and Aviram, like doing all the bad stuff? So this is where I first discovered that this is a principle. Okay, check out this Avram ben Rabbam. So first he says, they said to Moshe, some of them, some of Kalah Yisrael, but not all of them. And he says, because I'll say you can't be blamed for what you say at the time of suffering. Then he says, the sages say that Dasan and Aviram were the ones who spoke. But this is just a speculation based on the principle which states Kol sha'ata yaho litlos bershaim tele. Any evil actions that you were able to ascribe to the wicked, you should ascribe to them. Okay. And this was the first time I saw that there is a principle that you should go out of your way to ascribe evil actions to rashaim. Okay. And that's, again, what we're going to examine in depth now. Okay. Um, also, just to disabuse you of the, of the notion of Dasan and Aviram that you might have gotten from, uh, from youth, uh, in Hamas Bikil of Bershem, uh, Ben Ramam shows that Korah and Dasan and Aviram were tzaddikim. Okay, right? If you look at the Pesachim Shad, he says, likewise, Korah, this is in Hamas Bikil of Bershem, uh, Perak Zion, likewise, Korah, Dasan, and Aviram, even though they didn't reach the level of Nadav and Avihu, who were also righteous, they were great men nevertheless, especially Korah, not as is thought by those who possess impudent thoughts. Okay, uh, however you want to translate, bal machshavos azepanim. Okay, I think people are eager to look for, for the bad guys. He says, does the Torah not say explicitly about those who join them uh, that they were leaders of the assemblies, those summoned for meeting men of renown? 
right? Open in the Pasuk, that these were, were great people. It ought to be a sufficient proof for the greatness of Korah that they thought that Hashem had singled him out for priesthood, right? The Havamina, that Korah was a contender for the Kahuna, shows that he must have been on a high level, uh, or that he was at least worthy of it. As Moshe said to him, be before Hashem, you, they, and our own tomorrow. Let each man take his fire pan, etc. They strengthened their hearts, and each man took his fire pan. And there couldn't be a doubt which would necessitate a dispute if these men were distant from Aaron's level. In other words, there was a real machlokas and a real question about who was Roy for the kahuna. And if if it weren't for the fact that Dustin and Aviram and Korach were on a high level, there would be no such question. Okay, he does not learn that this was like some sort of like, you know, coup or anything like that. Okay, I, I mean, I, I think uh, from his explanation, I think he, he does hold that they were, I mean, he holds that they made a mistake, but he holds that they were, that they were on a high level and that, uh, let me just finish reading the, uh, just the, what was that? No, right. No, but the, I was thinking about it this week because if I ask a four a month cold a day lady, yeah, that includes Korah, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So I mean, you for know, the you mean. worship the Egel, right? <laughs> it's a higher level than most of the people. Yeah, and you know, I mean, that's clear. Right. Okay. Uh, just to prevent us from going down going down the rabbit hole of like analyzing Korah's character and Dustin and Avira. Uh, let me just finish this excerpt here. He says. Um, Moshe himself was intimidated by them from the beginning of the incident. Um, as it says, Moshe heard and he fell on his face and he prayed to Hashem to not accept their offering. Were it not for the fact that they were men of good deeds and divine service, to the extent that there was a doubt about whether their offering would be accepted, Moshe would not have stood for this prayer. So Moshe is davening to Hashem, please don't accept their offering, which means that there is reason to think that Hashem would have accepted it. Okay, And he says, and even after they were punished, Hashem honored their fire pans that they used in their offering and gave the reason for they offered them before Hashem and they became holy. And Israel saw their death and their absence from this, their midst as a severe tragedy, saying to Moshe and Aaron, you have killed the people of Hashem. From all these proofs, those who are discerning will learn about the greatness of Korah and his followers. Okay, again, very different way than we're used to learning about Korach and Dasan and Aviram. Uh, he's going according to the Pshat, and unfortunately, we don't have a commentary of Aram ben Rama on Bamidbar, so we can't actually have a running, like, full, you know, exposition of the event. Okay, so the main, so these were the three examples that we should have in mind. Okay, the main question, again, that this year is going to aim to answer is, why do Chazal villainize the bad guys and vindicate the good guys beyond the Pshat? Okay, so the answer that I want to examine first is of one particular Chacham. So this is someone who I had not learned his works before. And I found, again, from the footnotes in the Avram and Raman, that he wrote an entire chapter on this. Okay, and we're going to go through a bulk of his Sefer. So this is the, it took me a while to figure out how to say his name, Chayas. Okay, looks like Chajas. Svi Hirsch Chayas. Okay, Wikipedia tells us he is possibly the only commentator included in the back of the Vilna Shas with a PhD. Okay, he wrote a book called Mavoha Talmud, which is basically uh, a, it's kind of like Shriragon's Igeris in a sense that it aims to explain rules of, uh, of like um, how the Masorah was passed down, how things are derived, drushos, et cetera. And he has a bunch of sections on principles of Agarita. And this is uh, one chapter, yeah. I'm sorry, just for that sure. Just, can you say, <coughs> is it a little bit of a question of the way you say someone's great? You know, right. Does it mean, Mm. Oh, so oh, right. So I, I forgot to actually refer back, um, answer Pesach's question that the, he holds that the perfection of Korach and Dustin and Aviram stemmed from their uh, lack of anava, uh, like their lack of absolute anava. And he says that they're, they're criticized and depicted as Rashaim relative to the level that they ought to have been held accountable for because of their perfection. In other words, it's a, it's a case like you know, Hakadosh Baruch was medaktik with Sadiqim Kahuta Sara that that they were very perfected and therefore a little imperfection was condemned very harshly and uh, and and had disastrous consequences. They had some other good motive also. Yeah, Bikrovai Akadesh. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yaakov. Uh, about the main question. Yeah. Uh, isn't it possible that the Chazal is villainizing the bad guys is just the sheet about the character of those people? Ah, okay. So that's that's what uh, I intend to show that this is not. I used to think that this was a particular interpretation of Maisei Reuven and a particular interpretation of Dustin and Viram, et cetera. Um, the Avram ben Ramam, the Maharaj Chayas, and a couple others hold that this is a, an interpretive principle that they applied across the board. So it's not, it's, in other words, it's not stemming from their learning of the that story. That's not why they ascribe to them these uh, these things. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. That'd be a huge mouth locus. Yeah, which which could be, but <laughs> okay. So uh Rabbi Schneeweiss. 
Yes. The, the fact that um, Sari Menu um, went ahead and helped uh, Yitzchak, right? Um, I'm sorry, uh, Yaakov and Yaakov, right? Um, you mean uh, Rivka? Yeah, the, Rivka helped uh, Yaakov. Right. The right. fact that Rivka helped Yaakov, I apologize. Yeah. Um, that, and in his quest to fool his father, does not that does not net does not does that not show you that um, at least in one of the Imahos mind that uh, that uh, he wasn't worthy of uh, what you're trying to say okay. he was. So I'm just gonna. Uh, it's a good question. I'm I mean, just that's, gonna that's plain shot. That's plain okay. shot from the process. It's gonna be very no tempting. It's going to be very tempting throughout this year to take the many, many, many examples of this principle and say, well, how do you learn the story, right? And it's a valid question, but the purpose of this year is not to learn all these stories. You should, Avram Midrama has a very long commentary on, on Sefer Bratius. You can learn what he says there. Okay, I'm not trying to dismiss the question. I'm saying we have to keep our eye on the ball here because we're going to go through many examples and you could say that about every single one. Okay, so uh, now you have stuff to learn. <laughs> okay, so Maras Chayas begins and says, and we're going to, I want to read the bulk of this because I think there are some nuances that that will raise additional questions uh, beyond, like I could have just said this is a principle, but we're going to see some nuances here. All right. Likewise, he says, it was a received tradition of Chazal that the more praise they were able to heap upon the actions of Tzadikim, the more they were able to search for their merits and the more they were able to tip the scales of judgment in their favor, they would always strive to do so as much as possible. So he's saying this is an interpretive principle of Drush. They would, they would just try to vindicate the tzaddikim. Okay. For this reason, Chazal said, anyone who says Davidson is only making a mistake. Anyone who says Rubinson is only making a mistake. Same thing for B'nai Eli, same thing for Shlomo, same thing for Yoshiahu. Okay. And the, these are all in the Gemara Shabbos. Okay. Um, they also said that David wasn't the type of person who would do that action, but rather, and again, we're talking about the David and Bashava incident, right? So Chazal said David was not the type of person who would do that action, but rather the incident came to instruct sinners in the ways of tshuva. Thus, even in a place which is explicitly presented in scripture as an evil, Chazal sought strategies through the methods of drush to vindicate their actions and to minimize their guilt. Now, I didn't want to go into the whole Gemara and Shabbos there, but if you go there, I, I, I don't know if they teach this when they teach about David and um, how do they, how do they, uh, Explain David's actions as not being sins. Exactly. Really, you know that really he got the right, the right to send them out. Right. Mm -hmm. right exactly. Right. He gave you know a get, and it wasn't really an ashes ish, and 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 uh, Uriel was was high of Misa. Right. <laughs> they, they work it all out. Right. So I, I just wanted to show you again, just to show that this is not a uh, an uncommon thing. The yeah, Abravanel in his commentary, I mean, Bravanel has a long commentary. He goes through all of Chazal's, you know, Cheshbonos, and he says, these statements of Chazal follow the method of Drush, and it is not my place to respond to them. Okay, we don't bring proofs from or against Drush. And then he goes on and he says, but the conclusion of the matter is that if scripture calls him a sinner and he admitted his sin, how would a person be in error for believing it? Therefore, I am in favor of saying that David sinned egregiously and admitted it fully and did complete tshuva and received his punishment. And through this, he received atonement for his iniquities, right? Mepharshim are not afraid to go against Chazal just because Chazal say you're not allowed to say that he sinned. Okay, back to the Maharaj Chayas. And beyond that, they aggrandize their good actions, which are explicitly stated in scripture, and strove through the methods of drush to demonstrate that their actions were even greater than what was written in scripture, and that scripture concealed and obscured the full extent of their good actions, while the methods of drush revealed the extent of their goodness. So in other words, there's two, two applications of this to tzaddikim. One is when tzaddikim are depicted as doing something wrong, chazal will be malamed zuchus on them. Furthermore, when the puzzle only alludes to a certain level of goodness, Chazal will ascribe additional good actions and mitzvos and perfections that are not even said explicitly, okay? Um, he gives an example, and I'm quoting, the example, of the, uh, the version of the Midrash he quotes is a little obscure, or is a little um, choppy, so I'm just gonna quote the version on uh, in our Midrash. So the puzzle is, On that very day, Avraham was circumcised and, Yishmael, and was circumcised and Yishmael his son. So what's weird about the phrasing of Nimol Avraham? He was circumcised. He did himself, right? So you have a machlokus uh, to nine, okay, on how to interpret that. So Rabbi Levi said, it is not written Avraham circumcised himself, but rather Avraham was circumcised. This means that he inspected himself and found himself to already be circumcised. 
Okay, so that's Ray, uh, that's uh, Ruby Levy's position. Avraham was already circumcised. He didn't actually do anything. Okay, what happened? <laughs> Rabbi Barakia said, at that time, Rabbi Abu Barakana spoke disparagingly about Rabbi Levi, saying, you are a liar and a deceiver. Okay, he didn't like that drasha. Rather, Avraham surely felt pain and suffered so that Hakarsh Baruch will double his reward. Okay, now how he gets that from the words Nimol Avraham, somehow the passive indicating that it was more suffering, not exactly sure how he works that out, but the point is that he doesn't accept Ruby Levy's drasha that Avram was already like born circumcised, okay, or miraculously circumcised. Yeah. A little bit more. I was calling him a liar. Why yes. Knows that that's yes, exactly. So that's what uh, the Maharaj Chayas is going to explain, right? Not just that this was another. Right. In other words, you have Tanayim arguing all the time about how to darshan the Pasuk. Here he's saying you are wrong in the way that you are darshaning. Like you, you, your, your whole approach is wrong. Okay. So, he knows it, though. Like, it seems like so it is, I, I, that could be hyperbole that, that he's, uh, you know, the, especially the fact, I mean, if you want to really be like a nitpicky, you know, uh, uh, Shakran means you're saying something false and Kazban means that you're a liar. Yeah, you know, whatever. I think he's, he's, he's uh, and even, even the way that, um, that the Midrash itself says, it says, um, uh, Bahi uh Ita Akel Akel Rabbi Abba Bar. He's just like you know trashing him, we would say, right? So the Maraskaya says like this: Hazal taught us through this, through this example, that we must expound the good actions of Tzadikim, endeavoring to show that they were done in the best and most perfected way. Because of this, in the drushes of Rabbi Levi, according to which Avraham did not suffer from the mitzvah, but simply found himself already circumcised, there is no great virtue in his action, and this is not proper according to the methods of drush. So he's saying, You're a bad darshan. In other words, the Darshan's responsibility is to take the actions in the Psukim and then show how they're even more perfected. And your Drasha doesn't do this because Avram just like didn't go through any suffering. He just found himself circumcised. Okay. For this reason, Marat Chayas goes on, Rabbi Abba rebuked Rabbi Levi, calling him a liar and a deceiver, because according to the ways of Drush, there's an obligation upon the Midrashic speaker to glorify and aggrandize the actions of the Siddiquim to the utmost extent. Okay. Okay, then he goes on. Oh, sorry. And for this reason, Rabbi Abba expounded the anomalous phrase to mean the opposite. He suffered even more, and nevertheless, he acted out of love and accepted the afflictions upon himself in order to fulfill the mitzvahs of Hashem. Okay, he's, I guess he's saying that the passive means that he was fully surrendering to the, the divine will, even though it was, uh, caused him suffering. Okay, so then he takes a little deviation, and Marat Chaya says, see the small book on Agados from the brilliant Ramchal, who was moved from the words of this Midrash to prove that according to the methods of Drush, the Midrashic speaker is obligated to praise the good actions of Tzadikim as much as possible. I'm actually not going to read through it, um, uh, but the, basically the Ramchal in his little pamphlet on Agados, which is in the back of the Juggler and the King, uh, if you have a copy of that, um, he says that um, he brings this uh, quote from Chirshir, uh uh, Raba that says you, sh you, you should darshan at Lashvach and not Lagnai for good and not for bad. Then he quotes the Ruby Levy uh, incident and he gives the same explanation. You know, this is because of the rule that they received that all the actions of the Tzadikim that could be expounded in a praiseworthy manner must be expounded in a praiseworthy matter, uh, matter the opposite with the wicked. Okay. Um, and he says that if you're interpreting things that way, then that's how Hashem wants you to do it. And, uh, and uh, that's the, the correct approach for Drush. Okay. So just to clarify here, and just to differentiate between the approach being suggested by those three, Avram ben Rambam, Maharaj Chayas, and the Ramchal, from other approaches, okay, they view this as a genre, okay? And this kind of touches upon what you were saying, Yaakov, okay? So they don't hold that these are received traditions, okay? But I want to differentiate this from the approach we take in yeshiva, okay? We don't hold that midrashim like this are genres, okay? We hold that these midrashim are teaching particular ideas about those particular incidents. So for example, with the Asaf thing, I would guess, I mean, if you learned that Midrash with Asaf committing five of arrows, my guess is what will you do? You would ignore the Gezer Shavas because that's just, you know, that's just Drush, but you would say, well, what idea is it teaching us about Asaf that he was Kofor Baker? Like what idea is it teaching that he had Ganeva? What's the relationship between these five things? You know, something like that, right? But that's not the approach that Avram ben Ramam is taking or these uh, other two Akronim. They're saying that, that, that there is a general midrashic mandate that whenever you talk about figures in Tanakh, you heap upon the bad guys all the bad actions possible, not to teach ideas and not because you're interpreting the story that way, but just to ascribe bad actions to them. And with studying it's the opposite. Okay, and again, we haven't said why yet, okay, but I just want to show this is a, a, a principle. It's, it's, it's a top-down principle. It's not a bottom-up principle. Okay, they're not looking at the story and then like, like deriving uh, the, uh, this idea. Okay, any questions? Yeah, is yes. It possible to say that they have a Masora that that's the truth. Uh, the right. That way? So, so just because 
they want to be mean. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the Ramchal stated it the most strongly out of all of them because he said that it is a um, uh, the phrase he used was. Right. So that you have room to put put in that. Right. So so he says the Ramchal had said klal should be a dehim. It was a a klal. I think should be a day means that they received, meaning, I mean, not just something that they happen to do. It's like a, a received uh, tradition. Uh, oh, he says here, uh, shikaki kabal, right? He says it's a received tradition. And he says that that's what God wants you to do, that's right? That's how we know Rebbe Levy was wrong. Right. But then the question is, well, why did Rebbe Levy do that then? <laughs> you know? That's a different question. Yeah, right, right. Uh, that's a good question, right? Right. It's a good question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the you know you 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 have indications of um, right. You you have things that he did. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. It's a good, it's a good question. And and you know it seems like the general pattern is that they took the uh, let's say like Korach and Dasan and Aviram that the only things we see them do are things that they're criticized for and then that lumps them into the the bad guys category. Viva's Ace of Esabahora, or the fact that, you know, Rivka, like Leslie was saying, like Rivka thought that Yaakov was more deserving, you know, made them portray him as a Russia. But I don't know at what point, like, why wouldn't they just portray him as, you know, not being as perfected? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, I, 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 I understand, I agree that they embellish or they do wish for Tzadik for the good and for Russia for that. Yeah. Like, you know, the Ram says by, um, the mission pick up was Don Caldwell and Kapskos. Right. So it says like it's Sadik, like a person you know is it's Sadik, would you see an action that all like this right. is it's definitely a sin or, or almost there's only one possible interpretation, you should know that it's a good interpretation, right. it's a true one. Yeah. Because there, there's a Kazak on the person. Right. And he's doing good things. Right. It's absolutely possible. Same thing with the rush. Yeah. So that will definitely work for things where um, there's ambiguity. Right, it's harder to say that. No, I'm saying unless it's almost, unless it's absolutely impossible. Right. Uh, you should always assume in regular life, if you see it's not doing something. Yeah, in real life, definitely that's the case, right? Yeah. Right. So why should this be different than real life? Right. So it's it's it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think the if you look at like the what was that? This is different because it's why? lesson because it's written in the Torah. Right. It's not written in the Torah to teach you history. Right. In other words, when you observe someone in in real life, you have certain data that you have about the person. Uh, background knowledge and then what you see and this is telling you how to judge that person but what i think Fistel is saying is that the torah was you know written in this way to teach specific ideas and therefore it's not the same as just observing someone on the street like the question has to be what is the torah teaching us from this and if like the torah says that Ruvian slept with bilha but if you know somebody that's up and there's a way to interpret it where he did it isn't that what you it's, it's, it actually happened to right yeah. So we should assume Ruben really didn't do it as a real person. Right. Right? Right. So why doesn't that make sense to apply to, you know, Ruben's at Sadi, the Torah testifies. He's 12 sons. He's right. Sadi, so why should you? I mean, I don't know if that's. <laughs> it works the other way. Okay. You know right, yeah. Right. yeah, right, right. Yeah. Fine, but we give you an example, right? David is a David is a Sadi, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't that make sense? If you actually saw David in real life, you right. know that you should interpret it that way? It's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Anyone have an answer to that? That's true. Nasa and Navi and well, Khatan. It is a sin, but not what you think it is. But at least it's the, what the sin is. Right. You have well, to reinterpret the puzzle in order to take it out of the. Well, that's what you should do in real life. Why is it any different than what you should do in real life? Yeah. Interpreting a puzzle is different. <laughs> <You're> interpreting <laughs> a situation that you see, the Pasha is. Right, I think it's a good question. I think it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I got to give it some thought. Yeah. Well, sure. Let's say by Isa, and you see how not the first uh, end of. Right, is that right? Right, it's true. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yep. It's <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely not, not, uh, not, not the smoothest, uh, easiest thing to, to just, uh, you know, like look, the, 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 the other side is hard, also, you know, that's why I said, you know, a lot of questions being raised here. Okay, so then he goes and talks about the Rashaim. Okay, he says, however, with the actions of the wicked, they followed an important oh. principle to charge them, the Rashaim, with all possible abominations. As they expounded that Achan desecrated a Shabbos and violated a betrothed maiden, maiden. Likewise, they expanded regarding Asaph, and he quotes the Midrash, which I omitted here. They said about Achaz that he had incestuous.
tempestuous relations with his mother and offered a lizard on the altar. And about Bilam, they said that he had committed bestiality with his, with his she-donkey. So again, I, I think this is a very different approach than we take in yeshiva. And again, I'm, I'm personally more inclined to take yeshiva's approach is if we saw a statement of Chazal that like he committed bestiality with his donkey, we would look for an idea there. But the Maharaj Chayas is saying, no, they just were trying to heap bad actions onto these bad people. And again, he will explain why, but he's, it's a top-down type thing. Yes. Is there some system to have the Shabbat day kicks and be on them? I mean, there's a uh, so he seems to say no. In fact, he says like this, it should be especially noted that they aggrandize the sinfulness in each case by ascribing the most abominable acts to those who do evil, such as saying that they violate a betrothed maiden on Yom HaKippurim. Okay. Uh, furthermore, they said about Elisha that he saw the mothers of the miscreant children who had been killed by the bear, that they became pregnant on Yom Kippur. Right? It's just like, just trying to like, like, like say, oh, they did the worst thing possible. And it was Yom Kippur Shechal Yos Peshavis, you know, <laughs> right? It's just like a well, it's not entirely random. It's just saying the, I mean, I guess the particulars are are are, uh, are either random or they don't matter, right? I mean, it's not, it seems like it. Uh, in Yerushalmi, it says about Elisha ben Avuya that he rode a horse on Yom Kippur that fell out on Shabbos. Uh, in many instances, they mentioned that an ind the individual sinned on Yom Kippur that fell out on Shabbos in order to underscore the stringency of the prohibition. But just going for Isurim Chamorim, you know? Uh, I forgot to mention, by the way, I forgot to incorporate this into, into the PowerPoint that the, uh, you see from his saying this about Elisha ben Abuya, that this is not just about Tanakh, this is also about figures after Tanakh. And in fact, the Rambam in the Igeris Teman says that, he says, we know that Jesus was not a mamzer, but we call him a mamzer to degrade him, you know? So that this is not just something that was confined to like, you know, the world of Tanakh or even the world of, of Talmud, but even in the way we talk about Rashaim, we should practice this as well. You know, uh, like like tell you know ascribe degrading things to these Rashaim. Okay, um, it's like the uh, the opposite of the art score biographies, right? Like we were writing an art score biography of Rashaim, we just we we heap upon them all all sorts of bad stuff. Okay. Ah, oh, so that's what he says. That, that that's that, that's gonna be what he says. Yeah. Um, Chazal gave us in Sanhedrin a general principle that with all the others, one should not expound for degradation, except for Bilam, in whose case one should expound as much as possible. In other words. With the three kings, Yeravim, Ahav, and Menashe, you should not expound for degradation beyond what is explicitly stated in the Pasuk, except for the wicked Bilam. You should use the method of Drush as much as possible to show how much he endeavored to do evil, and he did the worst possible abominations. And this is like Repesach just said, you should expound and publicize them among the masses, for an evil man who is on as low a level as Bilam is likely to violate all uh, transgressions. Right? In other words, uh, he might not have done this, but he's the type of person who would do this. Yeah. Okay. Because of this, it should not seem strange. Okay, uh, this is a weird thing. He says, uh, or skip. All right. because of this, it should not be seen as strange in the drushes of Chazal that Bilam committed bestiality with his she donkey. Indeed, the Rav who wrote the Sefer Eitz Yosef attributes strange intentions to this Agada, arguing that the analogy employed in the Gemara, based on the similarity of the verb hiskanti used here with reference to Bilam's donkey and sochenes used elsewhere, is fallacious in view of the statement in the latter passage that the king knew her not. Okay, in other words, he's saying, yet following, I'll, I'll explain in a second, yet following the above principle of the Bali Agada to expound Bilam's actions for degradation in every way possible, they have done the same thing here, ascribing to him the abomination and supporting it by way of remez and far-fetched asmachta, as is their usual manner. In other words, Chazal will even use really, really, really far-fetched drushas and xerashavas that don't even make sense in order to be makayim this principle, okay, to, to go out of the way to, to say bad stuff about Rashaim. Okay, uh, and then he, he again, he, he says the same thing that Repesach said, quoting from the Rambam, that without a doubt, Bilam, someone like Bilam, who, he says, um, Rambam says uh, that the man who was degraded in his behavior to such an extent that it was easy for him to persuade the daughters of Midian to abandon themselves to licentiousness, without a doubt, such a man is prone to commit all possible abominations. So this might address your question, Esti, that you see that Bilam was totally fine encouraging the Benos Midian to engage in promiscuity. So then we ascribed him not a random sin, but some sexual perversion, right? Right, right. But the thing with the Yom Kippur and Shabbos does seem to be just like trying to chalk up all the bad things, you know, like he did this on Yom Kippur on Shabbos, you know? Does that not seem to be a certain level? It is a specific... Right. You could say that. You could say, you know, it's, it's a karis. You could say that it's, you know, something about violating malacha. You know, I, I, I get the sense, though, that he's not saying that. It was by the fact that it was Yom Kippur. Right. Also, not even deterred. It was by the fact that it was Shabbos. Right, right. Yeah, not sure. 
It depends been on been how you say random. I mean, you know, like, could they have said something else? Like, you know, it could have been a third like, like, you know, he, but, but even if it had come out of Travis, he still would have done it. Right. Based on the way. He right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Not, not sure. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, if you look at that Asaf Drasha and you look at the word, um, you know, Ayef, right. Uh, that he was a uh, weary. I mean, maybe they could have made a drasha comparing him to uh, Amalek because in the story it talks about, uh, you know, Ayef Yagia for Bnei, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> right. So in other words, I, I don't, I, I don't get the impression that these things are okay. According to the way we learn it, we're looking for ideas, and there has to be something specific here. I don't get the impression that that's how the Maharaj Chayas and the and Raman are taking it. Okay, uh, might be disturbing, but yeah. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Oh, so this is another interesting example, and this is. Uh, I'm going to preface this by saying that uh, that there, because these midrashim are not received traditions, there is a certain amount of creativity and flexibility in them. So this is a good example of that. Uh, he says, you will see a greater example of this principle in the words of Yushami Sanhedrin Perakhelech, in which Rabbi Levi, <laughs> our, our old friend Rabbi Levi, for six months expounded the Pasuk about Ahav. But the Pasuk says, because you sold yourself even in the eyes of Hashem. So Rabbi Levi darshan it Liganai for degradation. Until Ahav came to him at night, in a dream, presumably, and said to him, how did I sin against you? Oh, sorry, against, that's supposed to be lowercase y, against you. What evil did I commit in your presence? Okay, so he's telling Levi, like, why are you picking on me? Like, you know, what did I do to you? At which point, Rabbi Levi expounded for six months in Ahav's favor by the later Pasuk, which says there had never been anyone like Ahav who sold himself to do what was evil in the eyes of Hashem because Izevil, his wife, had incited him. Okay, we see, Ramaratzchaya says, we see that it is ultimately dependent on the Midrashic speaker. In other words, it's the Darshan's choice. For initially, he expounded all the behavior of Ahav for degradation, ascribing to him all possible evils that could be inserted into the Pasuk by way of illusions and asmaktos. But in the very end, he went back and judged him favorably. He even vindicated him regarding those iniquities and sins that were explicitly stated, expounding the verse to mean that he didn't do them of his own accord, but only because he was enticed, enticed by his wife, Izevel. Okay, so he, just, he flip-flopped, okay? I guess not. I guess not. From here, and now here's the conclusion of this part. From here, you may extend the principle to all drushos such as these that everything was dependent on the midrashic expounder, and no one had any received tradition on these matters. Okay, so we have uh, that is that we have established this principle. I think that this was a, a, a general principle of Chazam. Now the question, yes. Um, could you just show the quote? You're lumping together Marat Chayas with Avraham and Rambam, but, but could you just show me the quote yeah. of Rambam again? Avram ben Ramam says, uh, let me go back. Uh, this is on slide 87. Okay, so Avram ben Ramam said about Dasan and Aviram. Um, uh, that was the third example. Dasan and Aviram, he says, hold on. Here we go. Um, yeah, uh, he says, Vizohash Ara al Yesod Hahatsa'a Haomeres. It is a principle, uh, sorry, it's a speculation based on the principle which states, Kol shata yaho letalos Rashaim tale. Anything that you're able to attribute to Rashaim, you should attribute to. Now, here he's not saying attributing, I mean, the, here the puzzle doesn't say Dasan and Aviram, but we're ascribing the hate mentioned in the puzzle to Rashaim. That's it. Yeah, okay. but you're you're assuming that they're identical, or that everything Ramon is saying is just is the same. no. I'm not assuming that they're identical. I'm assuming that they are referring to the same principle, though. Okay. Yeah, whether they had this, where, where they overlap and where they didn't, I'm not sure. It seems like also the Rampal had different uh, different uh, applications of this. Yeah. So that, that just means when you have a group of people who do something wrong, you should assume it's the Rashad of the group that did it, not the. Right. Right. Yeah, it is different. Yeah. Um, okay. Hold on a second here. Yes. So, so we know for a fact that Izevel was evil, but we don't know for a fact that Ahab was evil. <laughs> we know Ahab was also evil, right? You know, one of the most evil uh, of them all. But the Pasuk does say two things. It says that Ahab was, uh, you know, what was the the phrase there? That um, uh, 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 I mean, that's not the only Pasuk that says Ahab is evil. And then it says... Uh, that he was Asher Hisasad Ize also Izevel Ishtel, right? That she uh, enticed him. Yeah. Okay. 
So the question though is what's the basis of this principle here? Okay, why do we do this? Okay, and again, if you're learning it out from particular ideas, so then there's, you know, you're gonna get, you're not gonna have one unified answer, but he's, Marat Chayas at least is learning this as a, as a general principle, okay? So he gives an interesting answer, okay, which I, I uh, will we'll have to discuss the merits of, okay? He says, the motive that caused Chazal to adopt this principle in these drushas is because they directed themselves and set their sights upon reinforcing for the masses, the fundamental principle laid down by our sages of the Mishnah, Mitzvah Gorera's Mitzvah of Avera Gorera's Avera. Okay, this is in Pirkei Avos, right? One Mitzvah leads to another and one Avera leads to another. Okay, how so? He says, because of this, the sages entrusted those who lecture midrashically in public with the duty of validating this foundational principle to the extent possible by teaching the masses that when a person follows the path of Torah, his habitual behavior becomes second nature to him to the point where it will become easy for him to do all good actions and they will not seem very heavy to him. So in other words, the more you follow Torah, the easier it's going to get to keep Torah and you're going to be involved in entirely good things and good actions of good midos. Okay, that's what that, and he's saying that this was a hitilu hachachamim hachov al hadorish b'machelos, that this is an obligation on people who darshan in public to, to reinforce this principle. Okay, and that's why I'm using the term the masses. I mean, he uses the term uh, uh, la'am, okay, but machelos, I assume, am is like, you know, what we call the masses, the hamon. And if we occasionally find these people doing wrong, we must strive to demonstrate through the methods of Drush to judge their actions and behavior favorably, showing that there was no sin or iniquity at all. For example, in the incident of David with Bathsheba, Chazal say that everyone from the house of David who went out to war wrote a divorce document for his wife. Likewise, they judged Shlomo favorably, saying that he himself didn't sin at all, but merely failed to protest the actions of his wives. Likewise, regarding the incident of Reuven and the sons of Eli, Chazal saw fit to, do, uh, to search for arguments in their merit. Similarly, okay, now he's going to go to the Rishayim, from a second consideration, they wanted to teach us an important idea, that as soon as a person deviates from the path of the Torah, even the smallest deviation whatsoever, he will subsequently require extra self-strengthening and vigilance, for he is faced with a threatening danger that Avera Guerrero Savera, one Avera will lead to another, and if he doesn't stand up for himself and raise against the inclination that endangers him, uh, he will be prone to doing all types of abominations, for he has already been given the taste of prohibitions. So if you just start down on that bad road, then you're going to eventually like, you know, like what's the Chazal that you, uh, Yitzhar tells you, you know, yeah, uh, I was thinking of a different one. That's a good one also is that once you do the Avera, it becomes mutter to you. I was thinking today the Yitzhar tells you one thing, next day another, and then next day you're worshiping about Zara. I forgot the Lashon, you know, uh, I only know the Rabbi Moskowitz version that he quotes. <laughs> um, he says, the smoothest way to teach the masses and to show them the path on which to walk is to only take principles from experience, from the events that happened in the earlier generations. As it is said, uh, remember the days of old, understand the years of generation after generation. Through the actions and conduct of the earlier generations, we learn and understand that every good character trait that a person begins to accustom himself to will take root and will influence him for the good no matter where he turns later in life. So in other words, people already accept the reality and historicity of these people in Tanakh. And we have, you know, this is part of our, our history and part of our lore and part of our stories. So that's how you, you inculcate this idea in the masses. You don't come up with new examples. You, you show this true principle where it actually took place. Like this actually did happen with Sadiqim and with Rashaim, not in this particular way, but you, you hook it to something that they are already getting from experience. This is not the case, he says, with a man who turns to evil, for even if in the beginning he only deviated a little from the upright path, in the course of time this deviation will cause him to violate greater transgressions, for it will have become entrenched in him as a habit and as a fixed part of his nature, and it will be difficult for this person to abandon his path and its consequences. Therefore, we require greater caution at the beginning so that the evil does not take root in us through our actions and become a fixed pattern of behavior. So you got to nip it in the bud. Okay, so that's his answer. What's his answer? Why do Chazal do this? Is they use the method of drush to reinforce the principle of mitzvah gureris mitzvah and avera gureris avera when teaching the masses. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Any questions on that? And we're going to discuss the merits of this, but just any questions on what he is saying? Yeah. He's saying that they will not show that the Sabbath is doing an avera because otherwise it will undermine the idea of. Uh, well, it's interesting. The, it sounds like his essential answer is about why we ascribe better actions to the tzaddikim to show that once you're on the Torah path, you're going to be drawn to doing good things. And then as a result of, of that, that a Torah personality is drawn to the good and is perfected, then when we see them doing something that is wicked or seemingly wicked, we do like what, what Rabbi Zimmer is saying is like, we assume that that it was not really uh, uh, as bad of hate as the, as the Torah makes it out to be, that really their, their good qualities kicked in and you know and we have to reinterpret this. In other words, he's, he sounds like he's learning this, those cases of vindicating Tadikim for their sins in light of this 
you know, general trend. I mean, it really is like what you're saying now that I think about it, right? It's like, these are great people. They're highly perfected. So when it looks like they're doing something wrong, then like you should. Yeah, yeah. That's true. It is true, right. Right, so. But not necessarily in, in each of these cases. Like again. A lot, a lot of it's like you have a disconnect. It's, it's, it's a true principle that persons are real sound. Right. Therefore you won't. Do the sin. Right. But the question is, how far do you take that? Like, again, with the David example, if, if David, if, if David actually, like, you know, again, it's the, the premise here, David actually did a, a horrible hate, right? Well, does a person on David's level right. actually do a sin like that? Yes. That's what, I mean, that's what Ravnell holds, at least. Yeah, you're not teaching the truth to people in these cases. You're doing this for the masses. But he sounds like he's saying you're teaching a true idea. You are teaching a true idea, but you're not teaching him the truth about this story. But if the truth is that Mitzvah versus Mitzvah on the person on Dove's level won't actually do that kind of descent. You know, no, but, but there's, 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 there's uh, uh, yeah, they won't be likely to, meaning meaning highly perfected people. But sometimes they do. So then yeah, sometimes they do, right. That's the truth. Then you're... But the thing is, is that, that Okay, maybe maybe you'll you'll like this in, in, in the answer that I give next. But uh, let, let, okay, let, let me try one more thing. I'm gonna give my answer. Okay, and then uh, and then and then ask your question again. At the end. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my understanding of of this principle here. And um, you know, Ram says kala hamis mini shamro, right? So I I happen to have read a really good version of something that uh, that like I'm gonna use to express the idea. Um, uh, the, the short answer is chinuch through romanticism. Okay, and I'm gonna explain what romanticism is. Um, first, keep this Ibn Ezra in mind while, while we're going over this explanation. He says, there is a category of drush which is good for others and to guide the youths in understanding. Okay, so I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming that this genre of midrashim is for children. Okay, so the person I'm gonna quote here is a Jewish American philosopher, Alyssa Rosenbaum. Okay, and she wrote a book called, uh, or an article called, What is Romanticism? So as I read this, ask yourself, does this sound like what, the, what these midrashim are doing? Okay, romanticism is a category of art based on the recognition of the principle that man possesses the faculty of volition, of bechira, okay? Um, and, uh, and she contrasts that with, she says, the practitioners of the literary school diametrically opposed to mine, the school of naturalism, claim that a writer must reproduce what they call real life, allegedly as it is, exercising no selectivity and no value judgments. By reproduce, they mean photograph. By real life, they mean whatever given concretes they happen to observe. By as it is, they mean as it is lived by the people around them. So, so romanticism and naturalism, okay, which we, I think, can call realism. All right. She says, the major source and demonstration of moral values available to a child is romantic art, particularly romantic literature. What romantic art offers him is not moral rules, not an explicit didactic message, but the image of a moral person, i.e. the concretized abstraction of a moral ideal. It offers a concrete, directly perceivable answer to the very abstract question which a child senses but cannot yet conceptualize. What kind of person is moral and what kind of life does he lead? It does not, it is not abstract principles that a child learns from romantic art, but the precondition and the incentive for the later understanding of such principles. The emotional experience of, of admiration for man's highest potential, the experience of looking up to a hero, a view of life motivated and dominated by values, a life in which man's choices are practicable, effective, and crucially important, that is a moral sense of life. And I, I can't remember which sheer this was. There's a sheer, I'm pretty sure it's in TTL, but it might have also occurred in Yeshiva when I was in Yeshiva, that Rebbe he was doing a Q&A with middle schoolers. Okay, it might, this might be the task Q&A. This might be something else. And um, and the, the, one of the kids asked, like, what? I, it was some version of the question, like, what is what is uh, the purpose of life? You know. So you know, as a yeshiva guy, I was thinking, oh, how is Rebbe going to like translate the idea of like human perfection into you know into his answer? So he said, the purpose of life is to live like the Avos. You know, and I thought that that was a really good like answer for like a kid because. Like, like, like she's saying, like, like uh, Rosenbaum saying, like, you, you can't convey abstract moral rules to a child, but they can't, they have an idea of a hero and someone to look up to. And you can, you can embody that in, in particulars and in stories, right? Um, last quote here, romantic writers are moralists in the most profound sense of the world. Their concern is not merely with values, but specifically with moral values and with the power of moral values in shaping human character. Their characters are larger than life, i.e. they are abstract projections in terms of essentials. In their stories, one will never find action for action's sake, unrelated to moral values. The events of their plots are shaped, determined, and motivated by the character's values or treason to values, by their struggle in pursuit of spiritual goals, and by profound value conflicts. So in other words, Esau does not just get tired. He does not just come in from the field. 
that's a moral action, that's a moral action, that's a moral action. And each thing is being infused with something that contributes to this picture that a child's gonna have of what a Russia looks like and what a tzaddik looks like, okay? And that's, that's, that's how I would answer the question, is that Chinuch through Romanticism, Chazal sought to infuse every action of every actor in every narrative in Tanakh with moral significance in order to maximize the function of these characters uh, uh, as personified abstractions of the Torah's mor uh, morality that you can perceive and think about and talk about as like as people, not just as ideas. Just a second. If done skillfully, this will establish an emotional slash motivational foundation for their subsequent mature learning. In other words, they're going to get this image of Esau as this Russia when they're a kid. But then when they actually learn the story and they actually learn what Drushos are and they actually like learn about his character, then they're going to get the nuances. But you've already established in them at a young age a very black and white idea of these are good guys and these are bad guys. You know, and I, I, I someone was asking me once, they, they said that a friend of theirs who's very attracted to the shot approach is is like trying to teach these nuances to their their kid, like their elementary school kid, you know, and, and it just it. I just don't think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a educator of young children. I just don't think kids are capable of that level of nuance. I think it could mess them up. Like I think having a, a firm idea of a good guy who you look up to and a bad guy who you look down on is, is essential for that level of development and you can build on it later. Yeah, Yaakov? Um, it's not just talking about the children, right? Ah, so that's the, that, that's the thing is Ibn Ezra, um, what was it? A lot of adult children. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, when, when, when they talk about the, uh, the, I actually wanted to, hold on, I, I didn't quote it here. Ibn Tibbin, you know, the, the, Abram the Roman wrote in Arabic. So Ibn Tibbin translates um, uh, the term that Avram ben Rome uses as the masses and says like, well, what do we mean by the masses? He's like the lowest common denominator, denominator of like, of, of people, like very unrefined character, you know, people who just are like, you know, tuning in for the shul drasha, you know, uh, and then tuning out. So like, that's what Fasel is calling like adult, adult children. And uh, the, Ibn Ezra does seem to hold that this category of drashos is, is for that audience, you know? And, and this is a big question in general with, with Midrashim about who is the audience. You know, you have, uh, I, I talked about this in the other shir, you, know, you have Midrashim like that one that uh, Rabbi Akiva, you know, told the, 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 the there's a woman in Mitzrayim, you know, who gave birth to 600,000 people. And, uh, and he says, who was that? That was, that was Yocheved who gave birth to Moshe, who was equal to 600,000 people. And, and the Rashba explains that he, oh no, this is an actual Gemara? Gemara says, right, he did it to wake them up, right? So the audience was people who were sleeping in shul or whatever, whatever the drasha was, and he said this to wake them up, you know? So yeah, this the, the, the um, uh, I, I think that if you're going to take this approach again, just to be clear, I I'm not inclined towards this approach specific like like you know I think if I found a midrash like this, I would try to learn an idea out of it. But if you're going to say that this is just a genre, I think that this this would be a reason to engage in this for people who are kids or people who are like adult kids. You know, yeah. Uh, I don't really understand this approach. You, you'll find the Torah itself glass like motion, like in, in natural right. thought. Like yeah, so that's a good question also. So we're, we're going to um, uh, uh, hold on to that question in, for, for one second. Um, uh, the, okay, there is, there are, there are problems with this and then there are exceptions to this. Again, I want to try to deal with both. Okay, just so hold on to that for one second. Yeah, Joey. Is there like a side problem to this that we like he's not being fair in a sense. Like let's say, he's, so right? He's really not so bad. Right. Now all of a sudden, right. the history Yeah. So I think this is partly what was bothering Rabbi Zimmer is that it's not truthful, right? That there's a certain there's something that is not truthful about this. Um, I don't know if you're asking fair for a specific reason, but like it is it's a misrepresentation, it's a right? Yeah. yeah it's right. Uh, right. Now you you can argue it's misrepresentation for the sake of. Um, of instilling something that is true, you know, in the same way that, again, I, I know this is Lahav deal, but like, you know, saying that Hashem has a hand and has eyes and ears, or not ears, but has uh, eyes, you know, like that's also misrepresentation, but, you know, Lefidat Hashem. Yeah, I'm not saying it's so far as like, right. Right. I'm just saying it's so far as like, I don't know, maybe putting the Russian heart back, right? Like, uh -huh. you know, like it's just not. Right. I wouldn't want to be what that guy. Yeah, right, right. Well, that's the yeah. difference between the Dalmat Hatsukhus thing. In other words, right. a person that's walking down the street, you're being unfair, whatever. Asa has been dead for a couple thousand years. I mean, is that you know, I don't know. It I mean, it seems right. It seems like that that we 
know, it seems like Hazal were comfortable using the narratives of real people in Tanakh for rhetorical purposes, you know, for like, like for, 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 for persuading people of things and, you know, and, uh, and not just giving an accurate uh, snapshot of, of, uh, of who they were. Like, it does seem like that was the case. When yeah. you mentioned that there, is that by uh, Moriah and say that? Um, or is the people of, or is I assume it's the Amorim. I don't think there's Tanai. Yeah, after. It's not right, yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, so it's the same idea. He's a historical figure, right? Now. He's, he personifies what could happen when you're having a slapar base, right? And, and again, whatever. this is a whole genre also of people doing this with Tanayim, you know, uh, of, uh, of, of depicting Tanayim in, in the same like larger than life ways. Um, you know, sometimes for, you know, sometimes making accusations of things that they did, you know, of, of time that they had, you know, uh, just based on speculation or based on, on rhetorical lessons. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not answering your question. I'm saying that this, you know, it, it's, it seems like everyone's okay with that, you know? I can see it in the positive, you know, less of a problem than negative. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Correct, right. But I guess if Joey's saying that if Asav wasn't right, right, yeah. But you're quite, you're more bothered by the fact that if if Asav really wasn't so bad, and you're making him seem so bad, then that's you know, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Um, I'm just a little confused. Why things are being set up with economy? Like he's not a sin or not sin. Why can't he have sin, but the sin isn't? I mean, like the different things that I'll say, this not that I was privy to something wrong, and he died and all that. I mean, right. Yeah. But there's a difference between, you know, nuances of how a person allows themselves to get into a situation. Right. Sinning, and because sin is this sin and not. Right. So th that's where you have a, a lot of machlogs in the Mafarshan. And like, to what extent do we say that the sin was nuanced? You know, like, what was the motive? And again, in, in the root. Right. But did he commit adultery like that was, you know? Talking about the sin referred to the Pasim. Right. The Lo Chata doesn't mean it's sin. And Rube Lo Chata doesn't mean it. Of course they sin. You didn't have a shallow sin like the Pierce. Right. It's not the hate that you think it is. Right. Or let's say, like, yeah. Like when it says, when it says Shlomo Mel built temples to the false gods, right? Did he actually build temples? Or did he just not object to his wives doing their vodazara? You know, when Shimshon married non-Jewish women, did he actually marry non-Jewish women, or did he convert women not for the right reasons and then marry them and they weren't committed to do? There's, you know, like so, yeah. There, there's and there's a range of machlokas in each of these cases. I'm sure about about what we take. But again, it, it's it's like you know, like, like if you read through those gemaras, especially about David. You know, you get the sense like like the said, like a lot of hash bonus, like working it all out. You know, and uh, and the question is like is are you, are you convinced by that? Like, do you, you know, do you actually think? But it matters what sin it was and why he did it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Right, but, but yeah, but it, sound, it sounds like we are not concerned with conveying this to the Hamon though. Right. It sounds like we, the main reason, like, I don't know when the last time you went to a, like, uh, you know, a certain type, there's a certain type of shul drasha, you know, that, uh, that, that basically can be summarized as, and we see from here that you should keep mitzvos and we see from here that you shouldn't do averos, you know, like that seems to be a level that, that the Maharaj Sky is saying that Hazal were concerned with, like that getting, just getting that basic message uh, across. And, and then when it comes to people who can actually learn the stories, then we delve into it and try to come up with, with actual, like, like figure out what actually happened. And we do, you know, and, you know. This is not that, this is just. This is not that, yeah. This is kind of for children, I'm saying. And for the masses, as Maharaj Sky is saying. Yeah, Ayala? Yeah, so um, going back to the sheer about, um, Drush betrayal. Yeah. Is this educational principle is it's applying to masses or like children or adult children? Wouldn't they feel betrayed when they find out the, the truth of yes. you know is that how you I, like, <laughs> this what is it, what it what would you know if, if there if there aren't enough real examples of mitzvah yeah. gorosa and avera gorosa avera to teach right. them, then I'd say, well then this whole thing is just made up you know right so that that is one of the unanswered questions that i have i'm, I'm gonna list at the end uh remaining questions that is one of the questions i don't know how to how to reconcile 
Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that at the very end if we have time, okay? Um, let me focus on a more primary problem here, okay? Unless there are other questions on this. I mean, I, I, there, of course, there are a lot of other questions. You're basically taking that people that you learned about. Yeah. You it on yourself, and now you're putting it into a framework. Right. What level of evil is it? Right. Oh, I thought it was a 10 evil. I just... You know, right. It's really, only uh, three right. Months. Also, at a certain point, you become. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this now. Also, Ayala, like, like you know, it depends on how skillfully it's done, right? Like, if you are, you, you can, you can get a kid to realize that this is a genre. Like again, like the example I always give is, you know, you tell a kid the tale of the boy who cried wolf, right? The kid doesn't grow up and then suddenly discover that there was no specific boy with a specific last name and address, right? Like he gets that it's just, it, 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 it's, it's a, a didactic story meant to tell you that you shouldn't lie, you know? So there is a, I assume that there is a way to, to you know, raise kids with stories like this. And from a very early age, after like they get this initial impression to make them realize like, yeah, this is, these are stories, but then there's the actual people that this happened to. And, and that's, you know, that's early childhood education. And that's why I never taught that because I'm a high school teacher, not a, I, I don't know how elementary school teachers uh, do this. You know, it's a very, or parents, I mean, you know, it's a very, very delicate process. Okay. Well, I, in the interest of time, I want to get to the problems. Okay. I mean, more problems than what we're saying here. Okay. To me, the, the qu biggest question is, is this a good idea? And I'm asking this both on the Maharaj Chayas' mitzvah, gurus, mitzvah and Avera Gurus Avera thing and on my own interpretation here, okay? Is this a really good idea, okay? And what I mean by that is several things. Number one, isn't it unrealistic and dangerous to portray tzaddikim as superhumanly righteous? Okay, on the one hand, there's what Rebbe Zimmer is saying, which is that tzaddikim are perfected and the mistakes they make are not the same as the, the mistakes that I make, right? But there is a there is a certain stretching of, of, of credulity in some of the far-fetched explanations that are given to vindicate the behaviors of these, these tzaddikim. So it's unrealistic in that sense, but also like it's unrealistic where you end up with these people. I mean, someone else says, you know, in, you know, there's no tzaddik on earth who only does good and never sins. You end up with these portrayals of these tzaddikim who just never make mistakes. Is that the kind of thing that you do? Like, is that the kind of thing that you do? You know, what I'm saying is that if we're using this for 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 didactic purposes, right, for teaching teaching purposes, there there becomes a point where it becomes so difficult to actually like like you know relate to these these individuals. Nobody's saying that they sin. It's just they didn't do the sin that I did. They right. Do, uh, the double mouth is doing a sin, but not the way we would do a sin. Correct. Yeah. Right. So what's, why is that unrealistic? It's true. And now he doesn't it is true, but what I'm saying is that if the right, if the goal of this is to right, right, who cares? You hit it. You know, let me just uh, say the three objections. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll address them all at once. Also, it's unrealistic and dangerous to make Rashaim to exaggerate the characters of evil. Okay, so for example, you know the Disney villain, right? That's not how actual Rashaim are. Right. Like like you, you or at least that's not how they start off. Like if you're looking in your own society, like for someone who is a Hitler, Hitler didn't start off as Hitler, you know, like like he, he, he became that. And it's much, much more subtle, you know, similarly with like, you know, uh, we were trying to think of an example like Bernie Madoff, you know, like that's a real thief and a real Russia. But it's it's a much more subtle, nuanced perspective. Right. So the, the question is when, if you are, are, are you know, uh, putting in, you know, these images into people's heads of these like exaggerated villainous, like, like mustached, like, uh, you know, hand wringing uh, uh, villains. And you're saying that's what evil is. First of all, that's not what evil looks like in the real world. Secondly, like, does that, if you grow up thinking that that's what evil is according to Torah, then like, could that lead to a, like a rationalization or a justification of the actual types of time and things that we actually do do in our real life. Like I'm not a Russia like that guy, you know. I'm saying. To, yeah, I'm saying if you take, if you take this approach and and this is what you're telling your kids and the Hamon, right? And they they have these very very black and white exaggerated larger than life portraits, you know, then it's uh then I, I think that there are some risks. It makes these people out of reach in terms of emulating the tzaddikim, it makes them not identifiable. Like if the only type of person who is a Russia is someone who's going around, you know, raping people on Yom Kippur on Shabbos. So then how does that help like a ordinary person struggling like with their sexual desires or whatever, you know? Like it, it, it becomes very, very far removed from reality, you know? 
all these, yeah, all these things being taken literally, presumably the Hamon is taking them literally, right? Similarly, the, you know, I, 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 according to the Maharaj Tzchayas, okay, he's using the slippery slope argument, right? That if you do one, one Avera, it's going to lead to eventually like doing all the abominations in the world, right? So the question is to like, do the scare tactics work? Now, I'm going to, I, I tried to find research on this. Uh, I didn't have time. You know, I'm a child of the 90s, okay? And they had a certain approach to drug education in the 90s, okay? And that drug approach, <laughs> that, that approach to drug education was if you even take one sip of alcohol, right? You smoke one cigarette, you're going to be shooting up heroin in the street with hooligans, you know? And I think it didn't work. Like, I think like, like if they did the studies, I don't think it, it worked. And I also think, you know, that there is a, a, a danger that, yes, there is a reality to the Avera Gorios Avera phenomenon, right? That's why because I'll say it is there's a reality, right? But that also has to be balanced with the fact that there, you know, there are people who will have one slip up and then it's like, okay, I'm doomed. You know, and then like, like I, I might as well just like go. I'm going to hell anyway. You know, and I, I think it, it's a very, very difficult tightrope to walk in terms of you know, there, if the only models of tzaddikim that kids get exposed to are these superhuman individuals, you know, and if you don't live up to that, then like it creates impossible standards that you then can no longer be inspired by in any realistic way. You know, like again, take this is a bad analogy, but like. That's the problem, you know, with uh, with these, you know, Photoshop standards of beauty that like like girls have is like they see only absolute perfection, and then they want that, but then they measure themselves by those, those standards, and then like they fall apart and make bad decisions. You know, same thing in morality. Like if the only if the only people, you know, if you have like Vilna Gomes who are learning, you know, all night and only sleeping for thirty minutes, you know, you have like these 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 guys, you know, or any of right but the question is how, how does it we know that we know that right but the question is how does that register in the mind of the of, of these kids you know like I, I read a story the other day. i don't know like i, I you know right and that's what i'm saying it's, 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 it seems, seems to be a problem like you're it's, it's risky you know like again like I, i've you know, I uh, I read a story about the um this I don't know which yeshiva it was a kid in, presumably in Israel some yeshiva boy who like was trying to emulate all the standards of piety you know like in in these uh you know in these things in terms of the learning in terms of like paspa melach toha and stuff like that you know turns out all of these were like neurotic you know um like obsessive behaviors that were like masking like eating disorders and depression and then he ended up dying like you know now that's an extreme example but I I I don't think it's so simple to say that like all of the, that people can make these fine distinctions, you know? So when the, the, the risk, the, the benefit of making these black and white pictures is that they're very easy to see, oh, that's good, that's bad. But that could lead to a certain type of extremism or an emphasis on, you know, uh, on like uh, just, I don't know, unrealistic human perfection. That's not what perfection actually is. Because also every person should view himself as a baby, not as a right. from a Russian government. Right. So you have these people who we hold up as models of perfection or models of evil. But nobody, I mean, I don't think I would portray it that everybody is in South Africa or everybody's in Russia, or you're supposed to view it. Is your abandonment and most people are yeah but here's the thing though is you tell people you should view yourself as a abandonment right but then all of the 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 way that you portray the avos and the shvatim and the you know shrine torah growing up that makes a much bigger impression than the one member that we quote around the assertion made shuva that you should view yourself as a well, it makes sense to study sadiqin gemurim as a model to strive for you right don't study abandonment as a model to strive for right right but there's no honestly why there's an implication that everybody's abandonment is not I, I, my assumption is based on the fact that, that these are the heroes of the good guys that the kids look up to, though. Yeah, right? and you should look up to the, them as models and ideals. So right. Like, like your Photoshop example. Right. That's what, like, every girl looks like that she's a model. Right. That's the problem. And right. They can seem like all their friends are exactly that way. Right. Not that there is one model out there. It's a completely different idea. Yeah, I know. But again, okay, again, maybe I'm influenced by the, you know, in the trenches. I've been in the trenches, right? You know, the kids, and again, I know it's just a small slice of, uh, of Jewish society that I came in contact with as a high school teacher, but you have these kids who walk in in ninth grade who have these exaggerated views of what tzaddikim are, you know, and again, the, the Gedolim books and these Das Torah and people can't make mistakes, you know, they do actually make these into, they imagine that they are real attainable models. Like it happens, like, 
you know, your kids might not fall for it, but it, it does happen. And I, I'm just saying that, like, I, I you know, I, I think that my look, making of a guttle, right? When that book came out, which was giving a realistic portrayal of what a real guttle was about, he, you know, like wrote love letters to his wife and, like, you know, had, you know, and there were problems in Volusion. It caused a scandal. Now, why did it cause such a scandal? Because people didn't want their pristine view of Tzadikim tarnished by the reality of like, what it means to be a human, that's, you know? That's like, not, that's not the Torah's approach, like what Yaakov was saying before. The Torah presents that he can have sin. It's like, so that's such it's a- so not our sins Torah. though. No, the Torah, the, nobody, the Torah always, it's so characteristic the Torah, that yeah. that he can do sin. Yeah. And like David sin, Shlomo sin, it's just the point is not the shallow way that you think right. he sin. Yeah. So if you make a God book where he never does anything wrong, that's unrealistic. Right. Moshe being sin, Shlomo sin, double sin. Right. The whole point here is, did he sin in this way that you think he sin, this superficial way right. that a regular person sins? Yeah, that sounds very nice on paper. I, I, I think we have a Mahalo's Matthews in terms of like, like how what actually happens to to people who are exposed to the 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 my midrash says, or what my little midrash, says, little midrash says, you know, like what what do they end up walking away with? Like, do they come away with these nuances that you're talking about, or do they not? Yeah, but we're, we're dating, but you're in the trenches, and you see, given that this is the approach, and right. now all these people are coming in on these right. Days, you're not seeing what it would look like in the trenches okay. the other way. It's be much right. Worse yeah. Oh, we're gonna get to that. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're we're gonna get to that also. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are these problems with the approach of like Hazal, or problems with the way we teach it to people? What, what, are the, what do you mean this problem? Right. I, 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 I think it is, uh, well, let's put it this way. It is definitely a problem with the way we teach it. That's fine. Right. And, uh, and the, the question is, how do you do, like, let, let's assume that the Maharaj Chayat is correct and this is what Chazal are doing, right? Like, assuming that, the, the question is, are there limitations on that method? Meaning that at, how, at what age should you stop using this? You know, how should it be presented in context with other things? Like, how should how should you transition into into pshat? You know, like what are the guidelines? And those aren't. I'm not saying that those are like problems with the approach. I'm saying that that every method has its limitations. You know, there's limitations to just doing an Avram ben Aram thing with pshat also. You know, so I'm saying what are the limitations? A problem would be too strong of a word, but there are problems with the way we teach it. Now, thankfully, and this is going to go into what you were just asked about. Okay, we're going to do one more dive into the Maharat Chayas. Okay, because he raises a uh, another question from a examples of midrashim which seem to be exceptions to this rule okay so he says uh, however see the response of the rabbach that's levi ibn chaviv who was bestirred by the general principle we established above writing okay so first he reiterates the principle he says we have seen that it is the way of chazal to vilify the wicked by judging his actions as liable for instance they said that anna was a blemished was a blemished offering who had relations with his mother and brought blemished offspring into the world they also said degrading things about lavan and bilam um by the way Avram ben Ramam also holds that Lavan was like a great guy, you know. Okay, <laughs> and he holds that that the uh, all the stuff that it says about uh, 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 about her, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, anyway, you see, that? and Pesuel also. All right, no, like, <laughs> uh, likewise, it was the way of the Pesuel. Don't say that again. <laughs> likewise, well, I, I wanted to do that to you. Yeah. Likewise, it was the way of Chazal to vindicate the tzaddik and to look for reasons in his merit, as we see from all their statements uh, that various individuals didn't sin even though the straightforward meaning of the Pesukim indicates that they sin. Okay, so this is all just repetition. That being said, what is this drush of Chazal that David said to Avigail, uh, listen to me, which is a euphemism for requesting sexual relations? This is in Megillah. Behold, David was a tzaddik, and we are obligated to expound the Pesukim about him for the good, even when it seems from the Pshat that he sinned. But here they expounded for degradation, implying that he wanted to commit a great transgression with Avigail, who was a married woman. And the Pshat of the Pesukim doesn't indicate any degradation. Okay, so uh, again, I, 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 you can look at that Gemara, but like he's saying, this is like a real anomaly. Like we're just taking, we're spinning a hate out of, out of uh, an innocent phrase and attributing it to a tzaddik. Okay, this one I think is more familiar. Likewise with Yosef, who was a tzaddik, uh, and the Pasuk testified that he did not listen to his master's wife and fled. How could Chazal and Sota expound? Uh, Yosef came home to do his work. Rav said this means literally his work. Shmuel said he wanted to commit adultery, but he didn't find himself able. Bikesh below Mata. Okay, so he wanted to commit adultery. And the puzzle just says he came home, you know, he came, the Yav Yosef lost his Malachto. And you're just attributing a hate to him from that, you know, or a fault to him from that puzzle. 
Likewise, one more example, Chazal expound in the Yalkut Malachim that when the, the Isha Hatsarfati said to uh, Eliyahu and Navi, for you have come to me, it was referring to sexual relations. How could Chazal say about this wholly superior person what would be a degradation if said about an ordinary person? Again, ascribing to Eliyahu and Navi this like that he was, you know, might have gotten involved in uh, some sort of a Tashmish. And how could we judge these regis men unfavorably in a place where there's no indication of evil? What purpose do Chazal have in drushas such as these? What moved their hearts to deviate from the guiding principle they had in every place to judge the actions of, of Sadiqim for merit? Okay, uh, thus far is the language of the question in the response of Rabach, and I found another example in what they expounded on David approached the summit. Uh, this is in Sanhedrin 107a. This teaches that he wanted to worship a Vodazara. Okay, saying that David wanted to worship a Vodazara. Okay, that's out outlandish, okay? So that's our second question, which is how do we explain the exceptions to Chazal's rule in which they ascribe imperfections or, or sins to tzaddikim? Okay, so here's how Maharaj Chayas answers it. Oh, actually, he quotes the Rabbach. He says, the Rabbach wrote as an answer to the difficulty raised by the questioner that even in those places where Chazal degrade the actions of tzaddikim, their intent is for the good, to praise the actions of the tzaddikim and to teach that the words of Chazal are true when they established as a foundational principle the greater a person is than his fellow, the greater his evil inclination is. That's another teaching of Pazal. The more perfect you are, the more uh, your stronger your Yitzhahara is. Okay, that's a uh, whole shear also. Uh, the evil inclination of David threatened to overpower him so much that he wanted to commit adultery. But despite all this, he didn't succumb to the act and was able to master and rule over his evil inclination. Likewise, because of the frequent misfortunes that came upon David, he almost denied Hashgacha. Okay, that's the, he says, which Chazal euphemistically referred to as a Vodazara, saying that he sought to worship a Vodazara. Alternatively, one can explain this in accordance with their statement, a Vodazara, a Voda which is Zara to him, but not actual Vodazara. So he didn't actually want to do a Vodazara. David had all these tragedies. He, he was inclined to deny Hashgacha. Okay. Um, likewise, very similar to like uh, Yumiyahu saying Eicha, you know, like, like, you know, like, how, how could it be this bad? Right. Likewise, with Yosef, his intentions were already towards evil, and he came with the intention to commit the deed, but despite all this, he conquered his evil inclination and didn't sin. This is a much greater level, for if his inclination had not been aroused at all because of the change of circumstances, namely if a lowly servant didn't set his eyes upon the wife of his master, then there would be nothing in the behavior of Yosef that would be worthy of such glorification. In other words, the general thing is like Ibn Ezra's uh, low sophomore princess example, like lowly peasants typically don't fantasize actively about being with princesses. So if you just assume Yosef is a slave, you know, he's not going to have any temptation at all about like the wife of his master. And this Chazal is bringing out the fact that no, 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 he was very tempted, but he, he controlled himself. But now we understand, he says, that this inclination, that his inclination had threatened to overpower him. And despite this, he was able to master and rule over his actions. Chazal chose this great matter with which to praise the actions of Yosef for the entire stage had been set for evil and he needed to exert tremendous effort and work to subdue his evil inclination. Behold, there was an evil intention here, but for Israel, our evil intentions are not reckoned as action as they said in Yushalmi Peya. This is a wondrous story aimed at aggrandizing the virtues of Tzadikim by teaching us that they will not be tripped up by any iniquity in the manner that we mentioned above, in the manner that the Midrashic founder is obligated to demonstrate that Avraham was not already circumcised, but he had to endure harsh suffering and he passed the test. Okay, same thing with Avraham with Rabbi Levi's thing. So the answer is these are not showing sins. They're showing the greatness of the tzaddikim that they had a conflict with the Sahara, but they prevailed. Okay, so it is not an exception to the rule. In fact, it's a, it's, it's a key in the rule. Okay. And based on this, this is the last uh, step in this year, at least, okay, um, without not counting the uh, questions at the end. Um, the answer to question number one of like, what do you do with this principle of, uh, of the, you know, these larger than life portrayals? So I think you do need both approaches, okay? You need the approach of the romantic larger than life portrayals of Tadikim and Rashaim, but I think that these types of Chazal that show that these were great people, right? These are not ordinary people, these are great people, but they also struggled with the Yitzhar Hara and they overcame them that can actually have a real influence on a person in a way where they can learn from there. Like, I mean, the story that comes to my mind is the thing with Abaye, that right, Abaye was following that young couple uh, and he thought, you know, uh, and he was gonna like warn them if they got into a situation of Yehud. And then like, he saw that they weren't actually doing Yehud. And then he, he like, I think he cried and said like, if I were in that situation, I would have been, uh, I would have succumbed as well. Now we know Abaye is a tzaddik, right? But you see the fact that he was, was you know, uh, that he grappled with his Yetzer 
is something that like, you know, that's what we call like a relatable uh, idea that you can, you can still, you know, l learn that they are tzaddikim, but also draw lessons that you can apply to yourself, as opposed to if Yosef was portrayed as he just wasn't even tempted. So then what is that, what, what are you supposed to do if you are, uh, if you, if you are tempted, you know? Um, so I think you need both. And I'm going to illustrate this with, I was talking about this with someone and someone said, you should just bring this in. Okay. So Bruce Lee uh, had this thing uh, commissioned for his dojo. Okay. That he called the three stages of cultivation, which he says are the three stages in any art. Okay. Whether it's martial arts, whether it's like learning to play music, whether it's, you know, uh, cooking. So um, the three stages are partiality. Okay. Running to the extreme. Okay. And this is the problem that I have witnessed in as a high school teacher and also in, uh, I, I see this trends of this in the academic world, which is that people either are going for these larger than life midrashic portrayals of, uh, of, you know, of the characters in Tanakh, and then they end up with all the problems that we said before, or, and this is what you were saying, people get to the point where they are so focused on trying to make the characters in Tanakh relatable that they erase all perfection and they, they posit other things that are not warranted by the Pesukim. And they, you know, basically you end up with the Tzadikim and Torah just being like us facing the same temptations and emotions. And, uh, or people who are so preoccupied with historical history, like with the, the, uh, the, the verifiable evidence-based historicity that they lose sight of the fact that we're even trying to learn moral ideas from the Tzadikim, you know? And, and that's how, that, that, that's the problem that the world is in right now, okay? What we're trying to get to, is the second stage, okay, fluidity, where you are using elements of both and constantly cycling in between them. And I think that there are examples of this in the Mepharshim. I think that, you know, one of the reasons, even though I'm drawn to Pshat, you know, I do favor people like the Radak and the Abravanel over people like the Rashbam and the Ibn Ezra, okay, not because they gave better Pshat, but because the Radak and the Abravanel will will explain both the shot and the midrash and they'll make use of each to to shed light on the other and i think you know the the Humashir in this yeshiva do a very good job of that you know of like in in uh, in you know uh, rebbe's uh, shirim on Humash, like it's not like he's going exclusively shot he's not going exclusively midrash and he's weaving it together the easier said than done right but then the ultimate level that you're trying to get to the third level is what Bruce Lee calls emptiness, right? The formless form, where you are no longer needing to make, re in this case, it's no longer needing to make recourse to the to one method or the other, but you have actually internalized an idea of what Torah, what perfection is, what human perfection is in Torah, and you you are no longer in need of these didactic like aids. You know, like that's the idea that we're striving for, where where you you know what perfection is, and you can then apply the Torah ideas directly to yourself, not through just like the uh, the particulars that you're getting from the Chumash. Like you you want to actually become a tzaddik. You know, not just like talk about what a tzaddik does and doesn't do. Um, and, uh, and so th that's, I think, where we need to figure out, as well, I say we, I mean, like, whether you're an educator or like a parent or whatever, we need to figure out how to get to that, to this point, using both of these tools of, of these absolute black and white portrayals, but then also the nuances of the shot and, and like, like the subtle moral dilemmas. Um, and I, I just want to end up with a few questions, and then I'll, I'll take, uh, I want to end by 12.15, so I'll officially end at 12.15, and then we'll go on uh, with other questions. So just questions to leave off with here, okay? And these are my questions. Uh, is romanticism in a state of decline today, okay? And if, sh if so, should we favor realism? And by favor, I don't mean do away with romanticism, okay? I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Um, if you wish to check the moral pulse of a society, look at its depiction of Batman villains. Okay, here's a trend, okay? Look at the Joker. Right, so in you have four four jokers here, all right, and uh, I, I apologize for people who are not holding a Batman, but uh, you know the '60s version of of, uh, of the Joker was this extreme caricature, completely senseless, not even a Russia, just like a clown. <laughs> okay, no no fun intended. Jack Nicholson's Joker was a little bit more realistic. He had actual like you know somewhat of a plan, somewhat of an agenda. Keith Ledger's Joker had a actual philosophy of evil. And then the, sorry, I actually typed Ledger twice. And then Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix, um, uh, the idea behind his Joker was to, to basically depict someone that could be any one of us, or not any one of us, but someone in an actual society, you know? And what you're seeing is this, and again, I'm, so I'm not, I don't, I'm not knowledgeable about like, um, 
uh, trends in literature or anything. I'm just speaking as like a movie movie goer. I feel like in the superhero genre, then there has been a move from these mythological, very exaggerated, like pure good, pure evil characters over the years to a much more nuanced version of, of superheroes in conflicts and villains in conflicts. And it's very hard, you know, if you're a little kid growing up in the 20s, then you're inspired by a Superman who would literally do anything. But if you're a kid growing up now, you can't relate to a Superman who could do anything. Like that's just not the type of, it, it, it's fallen out of fashion. It, 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 it is not as inspiring or moving anymore. And you want people who are much more, much closer to the people who are, who, who you interact with in everyday life, you know? So I, I don't know whether this trend is actually true, but, true, but what, what I'm asking is there is such a thing as different genres that are in style or out of style. And what I'm wondering is, is if we actually are gonna be using the method of drush in the way that Hazal intended. And remember, this is not, it's not like the only drushes we have are the ones that they wrote. Like when we explain Aesop's actions to our kids, we have to depict Aesop in a certain way, right? The question is, is, you know, what will actually move children and students now? And, and you know, should, should, maybe we should, you know, provide, uh, maybe we should focus more on the drushes of Hazal in that latter category about showing how the Tadihim were, were actually struggling with conflict. Like, for example, you know, there are, are students who, who have bad stuff happen to them, you know? Now, if they see that David had bad stuff happen to him and he almost denied Hashgaha, but then we go and we see that no, he knew that those were just you know his his uh, his fears or his emotions, and we show how he he investigated the dark Hashem and then like you know uh, arrived at an understanding of mishpat. To me, that resonates much more with someone who says, "Oh, Sadiq Mitor never had conflict with God. You know, never had conflict with uh, with uh, with with believing Hashgaha." Like I know that if I'm teaching teenagers they're going to be able to relate to the David who had bad stuff happen to him and like had questions than someone who just never has questions at all. You know? Yeah. Your experience was that high school teachers were teaching that? But... I don't know about high school teachers, but middle school teachers, I, I, I can judge, you know, thank, you know, thank God at our school, you know, then high school teachers weren't teaching that, but the kids we got in uh, from other schools in ninth grade, then there were a lot of kids who had these like, you know, exaggerated ideas. And I, what I'm, what I'm asking is, sorry, what I'm asking is that it, are are these types of Disney esque heroes and villains? Are they are they still resonant in the same way as they were when Hazal were 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 using these methods for the masses? You know, like again, I, I don't think you're going to go to if you're giving a drusha in shul, okay, and you you say that like you know uh, I don't know you, you give a drusha about how a certain sadiq was never even tempted to steal, right? And you got a guy in shul who like is tempted to cheat on his taxes. There's just going to be a complete disconnect, you know. But if you if you find an example, and I don't have an example in mind, you find an example where where someone like, you know, a tzaddik like could have stolen, and then analyzed the situation, and then realized that like like you know there are going to be consequences, or like this is not just whatever. That's going to actually like connect to someone. You what happens is you get a compartmentalized world where you have the world of fictional tzaddikim and rishayim that have nothing to do with real life, and that that's what I'm wondering is is if this was based on like like genres that were resonant with people back then, like epic fables and, 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 and myths, is, is that still as resonant now? Or do we, do we need to like, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, use a different method? Yeah. Maybe it's obvious, but isn't that like, isn't it to do it developmentally? In other words, young children do tend to start to feel like, right. uh, they realize everything. Right. And when they get to certain point, it's really fun. Right. Get the next level. I, I, it's entirely possible that that is sequential like that. I just don't know, you know? Right. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I believe I started off the Midrash of Betrayal Shear with a muscle of if you have an app on your phone that needs to be manually updated as opposed to updating automatically. You know, so what happens, like that's the muscle, the nimshal is that these kids are in a first grade and they get taught this first grade idea. And then the next teacher assumes that the kid's understanding has been updated and updated, updated, but then no one is actually updating their understanding. And then they get to high school and are like thinking like first graders, you know. Um, another question, uh, this is what Ayala asked, which is what impact do the various uh, chinuch maladies, right? Like there are a lot of problems in chinuch. Midrash of betrayal is one of them. What impact do they have on the approaches that we employ? In other words, like, is there a problem if you raise kids with midrash and then they have this rude awakening? You know, like, you know, what about the I don't know the focus on um, 
on uh, like kids don't know the basic um, uh, psukim in Tanakh and the events, you know, they get mixed up with, well, I guess that is the Midrash of betrayal problem. The, the question is like, like there are lots and lots of problems in Chinuch and lots of things that need to be changed. Where does this fit in? And, 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 uh, and how do we, uh, how do we attempt to solve, uh, you know, all the problems in the best way possible? Um, another question is, uh, are there other detrimental impacts of this of, of this midrashic romanticism on Jewish society? For example, I mentioned the promoting extremism thing. Another one is like, you know, you see these people who are like the most con recent example is the Chaim Walder thing, right? Like this, I didn't know him, I, you know, the, 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 but this guy, this children's uh, book author who was, I guess, revered by people and who was found to be like this horrible sexual criminal. And people could not handle the idea that someone who they, they viewed as a tzaddik had any flaws or any imperfections, you know? And so they just sanitized it and censored it and like refused to acknowledge it. And I wonder if the, 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 if this view of what Sitkus is of absolute perfection untainted by any sins makes people more susceptible to like overlooking imperfections of, of real people in society, you know? I, I don't know. Um, Another example of if, 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 we stigmatize, if we stigmatize any sort of imperfection or flaw, does that affect the way that these, uh, you know, that, that people treat mental illness, normal human struggles, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in our society? Um, and then we have Fissel's question, which is how do you guard against the opposite extreme of like, you know, uh, dragging Tzadikim down to our own level, you know? Exactly, right. Exactly, right. Yeah, you know, and that's the, you, you can't go from one extreme to the other. And I think just saying, well, we should view ourselves as a Benoni, like, that's an ideal, but how do you do that? Um, um, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and people are very quick to say that they're going to hell based on the fact that they did one small bad thing wrong, you know? It's better off keeping the city given the Roshan and polarized in opposite directions so that you fall somewhere in the middle. Like, right. You yourself as a being. Right. Or, or you're better off having a nuanced view. So when you see tendencies in yourself that are inclining towards Rishus, you don't just dismiss them saying, well, I'm not that bad. You see, oh, this is the beginnings of something bad and it's it, it, it's nuanced. Um, yeah, okay, so that, that that's the uh, official uh, end of the year, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take uh, questions. Yeah, Yosef, you had a question? Yeah, um, what's it called? It seems like the like the crazy like Disney-esque heroes and villains, like that stage kind of seems to be like a scaffolding for like kids because kids don't experience conflict the same way that teenagers right. and like adults do because they don't have the same time as and they don't right. like, really like understand the conflict so much right? right and so i think like that scaffolding makes sense and but as they like get into becoming bar mitzvah and like becoming teenagers you should start like maybe transitioning towards well they had struggles right, right. and right. like you start like tearing down the scaffolding a little bit and like presenting mm -hmm. reality more you know? Right. Yeah, it reminds me of the Rambam's lashon at the end of Hilchos Tshuva, uh, where he says, "Hold on here, uh, Rambam in Hilchos Tshuva." When he's talking about um, how do you train people to go from shalom lishma to lishma, uh, and he uses the lashon of Hilchos Tshuva Yud, he says. Um, therefore, when we teach, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, young kids and women and Ame Haaretz, we only teach them to serve God to, out of fear and to receive reward until their minds mature and they get more Chachmah. We reveal to them the secret little by little, and we accustom them to this idea pleasantly, right, or, or with ease, until they grasp it and know it and serve out of love. You know, similar thing with, 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 with this process of you can't go from one extreme to the other. It has to be very, very slow and, uh, and, and benachas, you know, and accustom them to it. Again, the devil's in the details, but yeah. Yes. So, so just to clarify the different parts of your shir. Yeah. So you, your general problem is, is like the way we educate um, kids nowadays, where we create a caricature of drash, where we just make it extreme. Like romanticism is like, as you're saying, is the way in modern society we're teaching drash. It's not a criticism against the method of drash as it's appropriately practiced by Hazal. Correct. So you're not doing romanticism. We're teaching it wrong. Right. We're teaching it wrong. And I'm, I'm also acknowledging that, that their method was not intended to be for all people at all stages, right? That's part of the problem that we have, that their, the, their method was 
that romanticism or the Maharaj Chayas is saying a mitzvah or a mitzvah is intent to be like one level of education. And then we move on and actually try to understand. Well, yeah, at no point did Hazal portray Sadiqim as not sinning. Right. Right. Shalom al-Malfin sin. I mean, he let his wife do what his arm is the king. Right. That's a sin. It's like Hazal don't do this romanticism thing. I mean, they say, you know, was five individuals never sinned? You know, three. three, three, three. Never sinned yeah, right. Never, right. Yeah. Have you ever not like the right. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. But I do. I still. This is what I was trying to respond to Esty, but I, I guess it wasn't so clear. Is that even the sin that you that 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 they do that the study can do? There's different way, different types of interpretation about what those sins are. And if we say that the reality was that David did the sin as portrayed in the Gemara, like uh, uh, that has a very different impact than saying no, he committed adultery. You know, right. maybe right. He really, you know, do what the simple shot level. Interpretation is Shlomo didn't actually build altars to the bazaar, but he's a king, he and his wife's so Right. It's that's a sin. Right. I'm saying, so that's not romanticism, right? No, that's not romanticism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying the way we educate our kids is romanticism. That's right. Wrong. Yeah, right, right. And, and I am also saying that, that I think it is reasonable to say maybe Chazal did intend this to be used that way, but just up to a certain point, you know? So where, where do you see that? That Chazal intended us to have this idea of Sadiq and never sin? Um, I mean, just the example. I mean, not not never, right? But like, isn't that the romanticism that it's not he never does anything wrong? It's that the wrong that he does is so not wrong that like it was, you know, like the, 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 the horrors, you know, is that, David. Is that not wrong for a king to allow his wife to build all this. It is wrong, house? right? Right. And that is wrong. Right. It's not the same as an actual building. Right. Yeah. So is that okay? Is that, is that okay? Or is that, is that fine? Is that good? You mean in saying that Shlomo let his wives build the thing? You can stop that. Right. Right. I mean, that is a much more nuanced idea. That's true. Right. So that's, not, I mean, that's not the problem. Right? right. That's not the problem. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I Look, I also don't know, like, you know. You're saying that's not what comes off somehow because that message. Right. Up. Something's not working. Like, you know. Yeah. Okay. One more question. Yeah. If, um, in other words, you're present it seems like you're presenting it as a mafloges in the dera, you know, between the dera that we learn and the shiva sort of like where we try to find an idea and everything. Yeah. Versus their approach is saying, no, there's no ideas in here. It's just it's just a fable that's supposed to be right. an extreme, right, for a particular purpose. Yeah. Which means that so so that implies that there are no ideas in it, and basically we're only learning the stuff. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, we, we get good results. But yeah. I, I wonder if you really have to say that. I mean. What's the shot in Drush? Which one's true? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, so there's different levels. So somebody right. that's on our left that that is aware of of um, you know can probably can maybe pull out. A, there's lots of ways to write a fable. Right. It's not only it's not only, not only one. Correct. Yeah. Way, yeah. They wrote it in a way. Yeah. Where somebody that's on a level can gain an idea. I mean, an idea from it. Right. But somebody that's not on a level will read it and read it as a, as an experience. Right. I the reason I portray it as Mach Logos, at least between us and the Marat Chayas, is that I like he just doesn't say look for ideas. He says this is just a, a, a general thing that the argument in certain places was that the people Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> oh, so meta, yeah. Yeah, Isaiah. Yeah. We have loads of Midrashic Gada that are, you know, they're not either taking their shine and giving them great Russia qualities or yeah. you know, the opposite. This is a very specific type of, uh, of of midrash and uh and and avram ben, i mean there are a lot more avram ben Ramam sources i wanted to bring in but but he says like you need a certain amount of understanding to tell which type of midrash is like is which type you know and that's not always so simple like you know and he the he uh there are certain midrashim that are you know i mean that's a problem with midrash in general is how do you know what genre uh uh it, it, it is you know is this a a simplistic looking statement that contains a deep idea? Is this a simplistic looking statement that contains a simplistic idea? Is this a deep looking statement that contains a simplistic idea? Like the Rashma says like, or I forgot if it's the Rashma or him, that there's all three. And like, the only way to know is just keep on learning Midrash and, and then form your own intuition. But uh, yeah. Rabbi Shneelis. Yes. Don't we have, don't we have the greatest protection in plain shot of all times? I mean, everyone knows that Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to go into Eretz Yisrael. And everyone knows that the reason why he wasn't allowed to go into Eretz Yisrael because he hit the rock. 
I mean, it's plain shot in the pasuk over five right. times it's repeated. So right. here, isn't that the greatest <laughs> example of how you have a tzaddik that we don't have hero worship, that he's perfect, and everybody else is less than that. So I don't understand the, I don't understand the pedagogical problem. I mean, because you can't just tell someone that Moshe sinned and then that's going to correct all the problems. Is that that's not how you influence people? Like, uh, let me give you another example. There's another example that we didn't bring up. Like, you that that he's, everyone knows he's the greatest guy. So if he's the Moshe, Moshe, okay, Moshe, if everyone knows that, then <laughs> it just follows from plain shot that if you're less than that, then you're going to be less than that. So I don't get it. I'm not sure. Okay, I mean, here's here's another example. Okay, like. Mir we all know that Miriam spoke Lashon Hara about Moshe, right? The question is, what, what, what was it, right? So it's very, if you look at the Mafars from there, it's very like, it's, you walk away with a very different impression if she made, you know, a mistake about Navua and shared it, her, her questions with her brother in a way that like was somehow like not respectful to Moshe versus that she was gossiping. Now there are Mafars who learn she was gossiping. Right. And that, 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 you know, and, and I, again, I think that if you're teaching this and you're, 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 you're using the story of Miriam to illustrate, you know, uh, ideas about Lashon Hara, which ideas are going to have more of an impact that like, like, Hey, young, you know, like a high school girl, like you shouldn't talk about your friends and make mistakes about their Nebuah or like, like you see that even the greatest people were prone to like gossiping. Now, yeah, we have to understand that Miriam was on a high level or whatever, you know, and you have to, you have to strike that balance. But the point is not that you can find examples where people did sins. The question is what impact, what's, what sins are you saying that they did and what impact is your storytelling gonna have on people and how relatable is it gonna to be to their actual like process of engaging in perfection? So your advocates are the opposite. You're saying it's better off to tell like the shot of moving story that might influence the person more. It might be able to shot that she's really gossiping. In reality, she's on a high level. She might not have been engaged in simple gossip like high school girl gossips. And, it might have been right. a much more subtle sin, but it might be more influential to the girls who teach in high school right. to teach a kipshuto. Like the Ram says, we teach the story of really kipshuto. Right. Right. Well I, well, what I actually think is not one or the other. I think that it depends on who you're talking to and what the circumstances are. Right. I'm not saying one like, you know, I do think with, with, with you know, with, with the, I don't know, with a, a certain kid, then like the, I don't know, rearranging his father's bed and saying how like, you know, uh, he, uh, he was trying to defend his mom, like that's. But the truth may be more subtle, but more, more influential just to tell them, oh, you're moving really soon, like you literally lost. Right. I mean, that's not necessarily what happened. That's not necessarily right. I, again, I, I do agree with this statement of Maharaj Chayas that it, it's Biyad Hadoresh. You know, it, 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 it's in their, it's their responsibility to present Torah in a way that's going to have the best impact on the audience at their level. You know, and, and that's going to take, you know, different, different tools at different times, you know? Yeah. But for sure. Yeah. Oh, so um, it, it seems to me that uh, so there, there's one thing about discussing all this as, uh, you know, in terms of what's best for education. Right. Uh, but there's other point of, you know, like, 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 how do I, the independent, you know, the, 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 uh, a learner of Torah, yeah. you know, react to these midrashim, which is different, different from, you know, uh, you know educational theory. Right. Uh, and and what, I mean, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of the approaches that you're presenting here is that, so, you know, there, there are a bunch of tricks, so to speak, of how to process uh, midrashim that are, are, that you find difficult, right? And, and hard to reconcile with your other ideas of, you know, how, of how Torah works, how the world should work, etc. So, you know, so, I mean, one, 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 one uh, tool, trick in the toolbox I've had, right, is that, is that, well, you know, maybe I'm not understanding it properly, right? And, 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 and there, have many, there have been many cases where, you know, certain things I've read have bothered me, you know, many years down, down the line, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I'm seeing it different now, you know, and I, I, it doesn't really bother anymore. But I mean, what I'm seeing is that there's a different trick in the toolbox I can add, which right. is that perhaps I am understanding it properly. I'm simply not the intended audience. Right, that is a, that's, that's a valid point as well, right? Not every major is meant for the same audience. Right. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, good, good point. Okay, I think Mincha soon. So I think I'm gonna have to stop now. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you.